I don't know. Say it with me. I don't know. Good God, it is liberating. I am a towering mountain of ignorance. I don't know. We're taught to believe that everything has a reason. And so we observe the world, we see what happened, and then we define the thing that happened as the reason the thing happened. But I think a lot of the time we end up mixing up thinking something with knowing something. This is why it can be so impossible to talk about certain topics with certain people. They've tied those suppositions to themselves so tightly with knots of narrative and constructed reality and values that there's just no untying it. And maybe unsurprisingly, in those situations, the best course of action is just to be friends. Maybe even ask them about that thing that they've created because to them, it's immensely valuable. The world as we perceive it, as we've built it inside of ourselves, is a lie that we tell to ourselves, not out of deception, but out of necessity. We have no other choice. We simply cannot understand the world as it is, and so we construct. But sometimes I just have to tell myself the thing that is definitely true, the truest thing I can say, which is that I don't know. This is the Everyone's Agnostic Podcast with Bob Pondillo and Cass Midgley. Welcome everyone to episode 129 of the Everyone's Agnostic Podcast. I'm Cass Midgley. Today, Dr. Bob Pondillo and I interview Hank Vincent. Like some of us, Hank was raised in a small, rural, heartland American town. Christianity was the assumed worldview of everyone he knew, and he might still be a Christian had it not been for being shown the door at a church where he served as a worship leader. That and a few other triggers caused enough cognitive dissonance in Hank to make him question his faith, of which he's still in the middle of deconstructing. Hank points out that in his small town, people don't approach Christianity doctrinally. The emphasis is on loving God and obeying God and inviting Jesus into your heart as Lord and Savior. I know because I too was raised in a small town in Oklahoma, a hundred miles from his little town in the Texas Panhandle. Small town people want to know that you're in the club, that your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life, and that you're one of us. Christian hegemony is nowhere stronger than in rural areas in the red states. At these small-town football games, if your child doesn't list their church as they're introduced as football homecoming royalty, you are the exception. And after all, it's a club of the nicest, sweetest, kindest, backstabbing gospers this town has ever known. The questionable aspects of the Bible are swept under the rug, along with everything else with which they're uncomfortable. The supernatural acts of Moses or Daniel or Jesus are simply assumed to have happened. End of discussion. After our conversation with Hank, Bob and I do a brief commentary. Then local friend and clinical psychologist David Mathis and I discuss various ways humans use denial to protect their beliefs and their emotional security. Lastly, we feature a song written and performed by Hank. It's a breakup song about the divorce he's in the middle of. But much like worship songs can resemble love songs, this breakup song could easily be about his breakup with God. We taped this conversation on November 13th, 2016. We hope to encourage people in the process of deconstructing their faith and curb the loneliness that accompanies it. We think the world is a better place when more people live by sight, not by faith. Please subscribe to our podcast, rate it, leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Our show is available on most podcast platforms. Also, you can support us monetarily in two easy ways. You can pledge $1 per episode or more through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash EA podcast. Or leave a lump sum donation through PayPal at our website, everyonesagnostic.com. The smallest contribution is greatly appreciated. Our opening monologue is an excerpt from a YouTube by Hank Green titled Towering Mountain of Ignorance. The music behind it is Never Know by Jack Johnson. The segue music on this episode is an original piece written by our guest, Hank Vincent. Thanks for listening, and be a yes-sayer to what is. So, Hank. Yes, sir. Are you in Texas? I am in Texas. What what city? Uh, I'm actually living in a little town called Hartley right now. Uh, I was in Amarillo, but 
going through a divorce, and I moved back home for a little bit. Oh. Okay, now, one of the first times that we corresponded, I don't remember, it was a couple of months back. Yeah. You were really in the middle of transiting, you know, out of Christianity, and your whole family was yep. were believers, and I think... I don't remember if you're if you'd mentioned that your wife was distraught by your move or what's going I mean how did that come about well yeah and I'm still right in the middle of uh, everything as far as uh, Christianity and spirituality and all that yeah basically she had gotten another job in uh, another town here in Texas yeah and I uh, wanted to take that and we were kind of both ready for a uh, for something different so she went ahead and took that uh, last year at some point. And uh, the plan was to just, I would stay in Amarillo and uh, get the house sold, and then I would move there. Well, that ended up taking like nine months. Yeah. And uh, and so then, after that nine months, basically she called and was just, you know, we kind of discussed about separating, and wow, that's just how it ended up. Do you, do you guys have any kids? No, we don't have any kids. We uh, We've been married for almost five years. And we had had the discussion a few times about separating things just weren't working apparently. And I'd kind of always convinced her that, well, this is the way we need to go. Um, Cass, given the way we were raised, you know, divorce almost wasn't an option. It exactly. Like. Right. No. And uh, so I was in it for the long haul and I was like, well, I'll do whatever it takes, you know, to we got to stick this out because that's just what you do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, was was the um, was you moving away from Christianity uh, a, a piece a of it? Yeah. Uh, she's got no idea about that. Oh, you're still closeted. <laughs> oh my. So, cause that, that all really kind of started happening. I think it started happening before, um, she had taken that other job and moved, but either I was in denial or I just didn't come to the realization yet that that process had already been started hmm. about a year or so before then. Mm -hmm. uh, cause a lot of shit had happened before then, uh, as far as the church goes of where I was working and and I think that we can get into that, but uh, yeah, the subtleties of doubt and questions they happen all throughout every believer that's currently walking the planet. <laughs> yes, and not every time, obviously, does it end up in a deconversion. Right. It, it they figure out ways to compartmentalize it, or they just you know they tell mm. themselves whatever they have to to keep the faith going. So right, I was just picking up on the way you were describing it as far as. Even you, you yourself were maybe un, unaware of how yeah. much you were already... The deconversion had already begun. Yes. And the, I just think the reason that that's even possible, that it could happen to somebody kind of under their own radar, yeah. is that it, it's, it happens all the time where it doesn't always end up in, a, mm -hmm. in leaving the faith. It just yeah, is, right. I'm, I'm having some doubts and some questions. That's no big deal. Do you think it right. happens in in the people that are like more disposed to critical thinking? Oh, of course, you know, it happens more that yeah. way. Yeah, I mean, Perhaps. some people. I mean, because I know we have people on here that say, "Well, I, you know, I don't really believe, but I stay because I like the stained glass windows, or <laughs> I, I like the songs, or right. I like the people, those kind of things." But uh, yeah, there's yeah. probably an X Y axis. I think that we could do as far as the <laughs> X and the Y being uh, how much I need for this to be true and i hold tightly to the literalness of it right uh so the people that don't do that like the christians that say yeah no jesus didn't actually raise from the dead <laughs> eh, adam and eve weren't actually people yeah, yeah but like you said but i like the ritual the liturgy the stained mm -hmm. glass windows and they yeah. and they remain it, yeah i mean but in many definitions, many Christians would say, you're not a Christian. No, they don't hold on to any of the dogma or precepts or anything of the, of the actual yeah. faith. Yeah, so th I'm just saying that yeah. they, they're a little loosely held right. uh, pocket faith mm -hmm. is almost like a, what is it, a rabbit's foot or something. It's just oh, it's something, like a talisman they, or something. Well, yeah, something yeah. they carry around with them that means, gives their life meaning, but yeah. it's, right. not yeah. something that, it's not a hill they're going to die on. Yeah. It, yep. Anyway, okay. So back to yeah, you know, Hank. Are we going by Hank? Are you? Are you? Yeah. Hank? Yeah, we can go by Hank. And right. you're, you don't want to go by your full name because you're not out to anybody. Uh, well, no. I mean, I I go by Hank my whole life. So uh, that's okay. so Samuel. When, Samuel is my first name, but I, I've never gone by that yeah. except for uh, from my mom probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so are we going to put your picture up as part of the the episode? Uh, yeah. I, you know, honestly, I don't know of anybody 
that probably listens. Okay. And <laughs> no, no offense to y'all, but <laughs> no, that's all right. The uh, you know the type of people that I've been around my whole life, this is not uh, going to be high on their radar. And yeah, well, let's go back to that because so your your parents were uh, religious and talk very. talk about your upbringing. So I was basically uh, born and raised in the church. Mm-hmm. Um, what uh, what denomination? It, it started out as a United Methodist. And um, at some point there, when I was young, our church had decided to get out of Methodist, and I and I don't remember exactly why. Hmm. Uh, they just became a non-denominational, and uh, so and it's been that way ever since. So more um, charismatic then, more uh... Uh, probably more along the lines of Baptist, but not Baptist because the Baptist church is next door in this town, but. They're they're definitely just a small town Christian church. Um, okay, you know you're not going to so much get into speaking in tongues or prophecy all that much, or um, you know you would be probably in the minority if you even lifted your hands during worship in a sense. But yeah. oh, okay, so it's a Bible church. Oh. Yeah. So so yeah, it was. Uh, we just were always there. Um, and my mother was and and still is at the same church, the worship leader. How big a church are uh, we talking about? On average, now there's probably like twenty people. Okay. But when you were going as a kid in high school and such, what was there it? was probably I don't maybe forty people. Okay, it's always been a small church then. Yeah, I mean the town's only like three hundred and fifty people, so. Oh um, wow! I mean it's town. a tiny town. Texas Panhandle. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, north of Amarillo a little bit. So. Gotcha. So is it the kind of thing where the whole town is kind of Christian? Yes. Yeah, I grew yeah, up. Yeah, we in that have uh, Christians because <laughs> there's a Baptist church and then our church and then. There's a sect of uh, Mennonites. Yeah. And uh, really? that's basically it. Well, these towns, you could, and you probably did as a child on a bicycle or something, as an experiment, you could ride around the entire town. Oh, yeah. We did it every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little tough. And yeah. so when I go back at Christmas to my town, which was 2,500, it's a little bit, but I could still ride my bike around it. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the town feels like a Christian cult. Oh, yeah. So you remember that movie Pleasantville? Yeah. yeah it sure. starts out black and white, and the more the woman masturbates, she turns colors. <laughs> it's a fantastic sh- movie. I highly recommend it. The, the guy, who's the guy with the three names that's in that? that uh, he's now in uh, Shameless. He's the drunk dad in Shameless. Oh, I love that show. Uh, oh, I know who you mean. Macy. Yeah. William yeah, H. Macy. William H. Macy. Oh, right? he's got an initial, not a name. Yeah. but yeah, William but H. Still. Macy. Fucking love him <laughs> yeah, and everything yeah. that he's ever done. But oh, in, yeah. in Pleasantville, and just he, you know, I just love that movie. And I feel like I'm going back to Pleasantville every time I go back to my little hometown because it yeah. really is a Christian cult. Like the whole town. Yeah. There's just this, you know, I know we got to throw in the words so that Jason Alexander can take a drink. But there's this <laughs> hegemonic cloud mm-hmm. yeah. over the town of, you know, that, that if you, if you, March to a different drum, and you, uh, you're you're going to yeah. get ostracized. So anyway, yeah. enough yeah. about my shit. <laughs> so Hank's little town of twenty, of you know, three fifty, three fifty, yeah, three fifty, and and you ended up being a musician. Yeah, uh, my whole family um, got into it. Like I said, my mom was a worship leader and still is. She plays piano and sings, and uh, my dad grew up playing guitar and bass and whatnot. And so it just kind of progressed that way. Where I've got two older brothers and a younger sister, and mm-hmm. um, you know, each one of them, we all now play guitar, but we each, as we got older, we helped my mom out at church. And so mm-hmm. um, it started out, you know, they needed a bass player. I was, I was like in eighth grade and they needed so a bass player. The bass. And so dad was like, here's my bass. <laughs> Figure it out. Yeah. So I learned the bass. So we, do your siblings live in that town still? No, no. Everybody's moved away. Yeah. We all had lived in Amarillo and, uh, which is kind of the the mecca around the panhandle as uh, yeah. for cities goes. That's where everybody goes, and uh, yeah. everybody still lives right around that area. So everybody's within an hour from here. And they're all still believers. Yes. Yeah, and they don't know about yeah. you. No. <laughs> wow. How long are you gonna? I mean, it's you know, it's everybody's got that question of when or if they tell. Do you have a plan? I don't. Just one <laughs> day at a time. That's cool. The the plan is. Like I said, I, I'm living back home here for a few months. I'm I'm fixing to move back to Amarillo, I think, to uh, find my own place again and whatnot, and kind of start over. And yeah, I I kind of just want to get there because I I don't want to disrespect mm-hmm. um, my my parents here. Yeah, no, for sure. And it sounds like also that you're still parsing out almost what you want to keep from Christianity. Like, are no, you, yeah, would you? Absolutely. Are, 
would you consider yourself a theist or a deist or an atheist? <sighs> Probably a theist. Okay, so, so you still, still believe a in a personal God. Mm-hmm. Perhaps. I, you know, <laughs> I get it. I, ca- I came into this, this uh, conversation, when I emailed you, I came into this uh, a little worried about how I would be after this conversation because, you know, I, I don't talk to many people that have been through it. And, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, what, so, what, is, what, are, what were some of the catalysts that made you even consider leaving? Yeah. Mm, the people? Yeah. <laughs> well, there is a degree in which people, Christians are supposed to be known for their love. Jesus said, you're going to know my disciples by their love. Yeah. And they're a peculiar people, a, a holy yeah. nation, and set apart, and they should be different. And I think one of the things that everybody realized, and I did growing up, is they're no different. There's yeah. literally no difference between somebody who has Jesus in their heart and somebody who doesn't. Yeah. And yeah. if there is a difference, it was there with or without the Jesus. I mean, it's not a, a change agency. I mean, mm-hmm. it doesn't, you, you know, you're not a new creation. Right. right. But why do you suppose people paint Christians with this wide white brush that, you know, that makes you think, uh, well, white probably, but, uh, but <laughs> you know, makes you think, um you know, well, it depends on, on your outlook. They're either very nasty, very uh, judgmental, harsh, and what have you, or they're very loving. And, and of course, that's none of that's true on either side. Well, it's yeah. true because it was true before, with or without Jesus. They're the same yeah. people. That's right. all. So yeah. anyway, so that's one of your catalysts is, is that the people, and I kind of put words in your mouth, what about the people made you question your faith? Well, you know, I always hated uh, when I would talk to people— when I was fully in this uh, belief of Christianity, and they would they would say, "Well, you know, the the, the people are hypocrites," and and I, I would always tell them, "Well, if you're looking at the people to uh, to find out, I guess, the goodness about God, then you're looking at the wrong thing because we should be exactly. focused on God and not the." That's what I've believed. That's back what we've then. always said. Yeah. Yes, but and it's I, true. It's, it's in a sense, it's true. I mean, well, we always used to say that if you. Like, the, a hospital is for sick people, and a yeah. church is for sinners. And so the yeah. fact that you came here and you found sinners, yeah, duh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and hypocrisy is is universal, so get over yourself and, and yeah. quit looking at And look at Jesus, because Jesus right. is the perfect example of, of God yeah. incarnate, and not these, not these humans that are flawed. Yeah. I think it was just, uh, personally, it was a—I um, kind of really got screwed by the last church I was at, mm. and— you got fired. <laughs> I didn't get fired per se. Yeah. It, it got to a point where I resigned. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And uh, it really rubbed me the wrong way. How'd they treat you? I mean, what happened? Yeah. Well, so if we can go, I guess if we can go back a little bit sure. and just tell you how I got there in a sense. Um, so I was the one that, you know, was doing the, the music at the youth group and all that stuff through high school and and a counselor at church camps, and then I, when I graduated, I was going to go to college, uh, just a normal four-year college, and we had a friend that had went to a Bible college in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh-huh. and Cash, you probably... Um, yeah, what, which one is that? Victory Bible Institute. Yeah, it, it, what's the pastor's name there? Uh, it was Billy Joe. Um, Doherty. Yeah, Doherty. Yeah. But he, had, he had died, and his son took over here in the last handful of years. Yeah. But yeah, Victory was is one of the biggest churches there. Yeah, for and, sure. And and they have a Bible college. And so a friend had told me that he had went there. And um, basically I got trapped in because he brought a group of friends that played music and they put on a concert here at our church. And he came up to me and said, hey, would you like to travel around and play music? And I was like, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly what I want to do. And he said, well, go to this school and you can. Mm-hmm. And uh, hmm. But anyways, I went to Bible school and, and I actually became a part of they have another group in that Bible college called uh, IMT, which is in ministry training. And so you would go to school to the Bible college, and then after that you would do full-time ministry the rest, the rest of your time there. You wouldn't have a job or anything. Hmm. And uh, you would travel around and put on, you know, I guess revivals or whatever, mm-hmm. and then do ministry around town, you know, like uh, food truck ministries and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And so I did that for a year. And we were, and I was playing music and stuff for them. Um, and, and that whole fucking thing is is a whole different can of worms, really. I mean, because you live with this group of people, like there would be five people in an apartment, five guys in an apartment. Mm -hmm. So you had your guys and your girls, of course, different apartments because you couldn't be together. In fact, I mean, you could barely, like, look at each other without getting in trouble, it seemed like. Mm -hmm. 
of course I kind of fell for a girl that was there and we would be talking and stuff and then they would get on to us because they're like y'all are really spending too much time together y'all need to be focused on God and mm -hmm. you know all this stuff they travel uh, together in a bus or something yeah yeah we would travel together on a bus and go to different towns and do uh, youth rallies and stuff and and you know victory I guess it was kind of a good place I can't say a whole lot of bad it was something I was not used to because they're very charismatic mm, oh yeah um, and I came from obviously this small town and, mm -hmm. and like, I remember, <laughs> I remember like that first week I was there, uh, all these kids, uh, and, and Tulsa is a very charismatic place itself. Sure. Oral Roberts and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, they're, you know, speaking in tongues and prophecy, they're all into and that. They and they worship just, with their hands up. Yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, I just remember this one time we, we got there and there's a group of us, you know, it's a bunch of 18 year olds and all of a sudden the leader just like yells out, uh, time for machine gun tongues and i was like what is this and <laughs> everybody just like everybody's just like jumping and speaking in tongues yeah machine I was just, gun tongues <laughs> yeah. yeah and i was just standing there like <laughs> uh, hold on okay I'm i had sorry. never done it before <laughs> so i just jumped in <laughs> okay there's the new one <laughs> I think I heard Cass. You said something about you know fake it till you make it. Um, yeah, that's how you do it. But but yeah, the, yeah. But the I've what, never heard that one. <laughs> so so what, Hank? Hank, what one of the things that we're Bob and I are laughing at is that we're 120 some or 30 episodes in, and now we're to the point where we're looking for the new thing <laughs> oh. every time, for, especially for Bob. There's nothing new right. under the sun for me. But when Bob hears about these Christian experiences, this yeah. machine. <laughs> It just strikes me. I'm sorry, Hank. It strikes me as a little odd, that's all. No, well, so I, you know. let me unpack it for you, Bob. All right. So one you. of the things that tongues is is a yeah. prayer language, and it right. bypasses your cerebral vocabulary such okay. that God's will can be prayed through you. Yeah, but, but the guy says, let's do it now. I know. So it's like... Well, but all you're opening yourself up as a vessel. You can do it willfully. Oh, okay. And... Um, Huh. And at least in yeah, that's what we tell ourselves. <laughs> okay, right. But if we do it all at the same time, then it becomes like uh, you have to think about the way these people view the three tiered universe. Uh, so up from this building, where say twenty, thirty, a hundred people are praying in tongues at the same time, that's like a giant beam of energy going up to the heavens and rousing God. Mm -hmm. oh. And so you're trying to get God's attention to come, and the Holy Spirit would fall back, you know, like yeah. creating this really um intercourse you you know you're yeah. you're basically trying to connect with god and so if we all do it at the same time and plus it more gives power it, it's more power yeah and it gives license for like if people like hank who've never done it before to do it without being oh, heard okay. because yeah. everybody's doing it so machine yeah. gun would be let's go for it like let's yeah, just exactly brrr, yeah know? so there's a lot of jumping and, and hand uh, hand raising and, yeah and they're brrr, brrr, talking yeah in the yeah you're based, or like i've said saying. before you're trying to rub the genie lamp yeah. so that the genie will come you're part of this group you know i mean everybody's we're all the same age you know and yeah. we're it, it really it was at that point it was really a cool experience because i, I thought i thought like you know i've made it you know i'm, I'm here Oh, it's exhilarating, and, especially yeah. you look. You look to your right or your left, and you know, and everybody's doing it. Right. Yeah. It's. I mean, it's. Yeah. It's peer <laughs> pressure to some degree. Yeah. But. Oh, but yes, I'm, but I'm, it's. It, and then you're thinking, because what's at stake here? Well, God might show up. What's more exciting yeah. than that? Santa Claus. You know, when I were, I used to go to the the Rotary Club, <laughs> right. and the myth was that every time we sing Jingle Bells, it conjures Santa, and so at this little thing where all these little kids like myself. Where they'd break into jingle bells, dashing through the snow. Yeah. And what are we doing? We're watching the doorways to see <laughs> when. And sure enough, he'd come. Santa okay. would come. And so it's the very same thing as far as it's wow. exciting. Because for one thing, you get goosebumps. You, you feel yeah. like the, the, the Holy Spirit is moving. And this is, and we're, you know, we're a part of something bigger than ourselves. Right. It gives our life meaning. We're teenagers. Yeah, and we're yeah. lost with what to do with our life next. And right. at least in this moment, we're okay. shaking up the spiritual realm. So it can feel really fun. Okay, I, I used it. to do a thing that, I mean, it reminds me, the, the machine gun term reminds me of a thing I used to do with my kids, my youth group. And I called it multi-psalms. Okay. Multi-psalms. Yeah, so instead of praying in tongues, everybody would open up to a psalm. Okay. There's 150 psalms yeah. right. to choose from. And everybody would read a psalm at the same time. 
And because the Psalms are kind of praise, they're kind of in the form of a vertical prayer as opposed to a horizontal admonition. Yeah. And so every one of the kids in the room were reciting. And so you could hear, while your own voice is saying one thing, you could hear out of your left ear and your right people saying, Praise the Lord, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. And everybody's just shouting these praises. And instead of like having to manufacture them, you just read them. Yeah. But the fact that we were doing it all at the same time felt good. Yeah. So okay. anyway, all right. Good. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I hope I didn't. Uh, no, no, it's know, fun. Make you no. feel bad or anything? No, anyway, hey, no, no. no. He's, it just struck I, me a little. Hell, I laugh at it now. I mean, <laughs> no, yeah. it's yeah, it's you know that's the other thing is we need to laugh at ourselves because yeah, otherwise sure. we're going to shame ourselves and I don't sure. think that's yeah. healthy. Yeah, that's true. We're all a little bit embarrassed that we ever believed this shit. You know, some <laughs> right. some of us more than others, and we yeah. kind of we kind of <laughs> have to look back and go because what I just did is I just unpacked some of the good reasons why we did it. Yeah. yeah, no, I get it now. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. All right. So anyway, so you're there, doing that. Yeah, you're at the Bible and, College. I think where we were heading was the bad experiences that yeah. led you to question, to begin to question so, your faith. So basically, once I graduated from this two year deal, and and I studied music there. Uh, it's not a degree. It's just like a certificate of completion or whatever. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's a piece <laughs> so, of paper. Yeah, it's two years of. Uh, Printed on a Word document template. You know. Yeah, of just whatever. Yeah, and, uh, congratulations. Anyways, right. I'd gotten a job. The guy that actually, the friend that had went to the school before me mm-hmm. became a pastor in a neighboring town from my hometown, and they were in need of a worship leader. And so he had called me right when I graduated and said, hey, do you want a job? And I was like, well, yeah, of course I do. Yeah. And so they hired me as the worship leader at this church, and there was probably, I mean, I would say there's, probably 60, maybe 50, 60 people at this church. Mm-hmm. Back in Texas. Um, yeah, back in Texas, mm-hmm. near my hometown. And um, so I took that job. Obviously, I had to do something else because I, I didn't I had to supplement my income because it was just part-time. Mm-hmm. So I was at this church for three years or so. Um, that My friend had left to another church, and we kind of, just one of the leaders of the church kind of took over as pastor, and we got really pretty close, and he was a really big mentor to me as far as my, my belief and everything like that. And, um, I had left that church because I started dating my soon to be ex-wife, I guess, but started dating her mm-hmm. and she lived in Amarillo. So I needed to get there. So I moved there. Um, and you left that, on good terms. Yeah. Yeah. We left on good terms. Okay. It was, you know, they had hired another pastor and, um, you know, I spent three years there and everything was good there. No big deal. But that guy that had pastored there, the most of the time I was there, that kind of took over, um, he ended up killing himself. Oh, geez. Oh. And um, I, that may have been one of the first things that kind of shook me because this was a guy that I thought had it all there and mm-hmm. had it all figured out. And I took a lot from when I was there at that church mm-hmm. to find out that there was still something that even he could not handle. Mm-hmm. So... That kind of shook me, and that that may have got me thinking there at the beginning of you know how do you deal with with suicide from somebody that is supposedly yeah. the the epitome of a Christian, you know? Right. And uh, so I'd moved and got a job in Amarillo at another church. It was a large church physically. I mean, it had a nice big building, and uh, there must have been some money involved somewhere down the line. But their membership had dropped to around thirty or so, and they needed. A worship leader. So I got a job there and it was also just part time and uh, spent a few years there. And then, you know, the church was basically just dying. We just couldn't figure out what it is to bring people in. So they started looking at different pastors and we ended up getting a college pastor from a big church there in Amarillo. Uh, Trinity is the name of this church. And it's probably the biggest church in Amarillo, and they're very charismatic, kind of a lot like Victory was. And and he was the college pastor, and he kind of came in, young dude, he was cool, you know, and he kind of brought in a whole new crew of people. And then, you know, the first meeting we had had, I had been the worship leader there for almost three years, and or two years. And um, he said, hey, you know, we're going to bring this other guy in, and we kind of want y'all both to tag team this because it's such a you know, to transition from basically one church to another church uh, because he brought in a whole new, like, leadership core. Um, And uh, so it just started out like that, and uh, everybody was nice enough, and and we kind of started tag-teaming being worship leaders. I was still getting paid, and 
everything seemed all right. And then it basically went from me leading every Sunday to then I was kind of leading every other Sunday. And then as the church grew, I mean, hell, it doubled um, in a year. I mean, we had probably 200 or so people. It over doubled. Um, and then it ended up being like, all right, you know, then I was only getting scheduled like once a month. Mm-hmm. And then they wanted me to start playing like just guitar and not singing. Mm-hmm. And They're squeezing the, you out. Yeah, and the whole time they're they're just saying, you know, you're the worship leader, you're still the worship leader. And they had already squeezed out all of my musicians because they weren't, quote unquote, good enough to make the, the A team. Yeah. And um, because they had had tryouts and they told me it was just because they kind of have to like and I'm sitting here and I know all my people and know all their hearts are in this good spot. But, yeah, they weren't the best musicians, but, you know, they were there every Sunday. Mm -hmm. So basically I was the only one left out of that church as far as the musician team in leadership still. And uh, I think they were even still trying to push me out. But I was I just happened to be good enough, I guess, to keep up with. Mm-hmm. The the mega church musicians. Now those those players that left or that left left the team and that were friends yeah. with yours. Did they stay yeah. in the church or were they no, hurt? They they left the church because because they got hurt from yeah. the whole deal. Because I mean they had invested way more time than I did because they were already at this church. Oh yeah. Well, uh, you know this happens in corporate America all the time. The new yes. guy comes in, brings all his people, and yeah. everybody right. eventually. Right. And of course they always say everything's going to be fine. Everything's right. going to be the same, and it isn't. No, <laughs> it is pretty. I've seen it over and over again. Yeah. If yeah. they would have just told us this is what their plan was, it probably would have been easier to swallow. But yeah, kinder anyway. Yeah, but it's just this passive aggressive, like no, ev- everything's good, and then we'll just slowly like make it to where you leave. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. And so, it eventually got to where uh, they, you know, I was still quote unquote the worship leader, but I was only leading like once a month, and mm. and uh, I remember one Sunday I showed up, and I was actually only scheduled to play acoustic guitar that that Sunday not do anything else and so we were before practice you know we always get together to pray or whatever and the guy comes up the guy that was kind of helping make the transition came up and got the whole worship team together and said that he had an announcement and they wanted to announce the new worship leader and they announced this guy's name that had been helping and they said this is the new worship leader and I'm standing right there oh my gosh and they hadn't said anything to me and so I'm yeah. right there in front of all these people. Then we prayed and we practiced and we had church. Yeah. And that was that. And the whole time you had a knot in your stomach. Yeah. I was just like, so I, I had um, emailed the pastor and just said, you know, what the heck's going on? You know? And he said, well, you know, he said, let's meet and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and we can talk. And so I was just confused at what was happening. Um, but when I met with him, he basically it came down to they didn't think that I was going that I had enough time extra time cuz they wanted to have this position require like 20 hours a week at the church mm-hmm. uh and I work in the oil field I drive a truck and so mm-hmm. I work like 70 hours a week anyways mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. and he said we just assumed that you wouldn't be able to put the time in so we went ahead and went a different direction mm-hmm. and I said well you're probably right. I probably would have had to turn it down, but I really wish yeah, you would have Yeah, that's a conversation least... that should have took place. For yeah, sure. I yeah, said, you should, have, you should have came to me and told me what was going on, at least given me the opportunity to say, hey, let me work something out mm-hmm. if I wanted to. So, so the politics of church, you know, kind of landed in your lap in, a, yeah. in an ugly way, and it happens to a lot of people. Yeah. And, then, yeah, and then he wanted me to meet with this new worship leader, and he was actually kind of a friend of mine, and so I met with him, and we had the same discussion, and... They basically came down and said, you know, like, we understand why you're upset. We're sorry that it happened. It, you know, it wasn't meant to be that way. And we went through this whole ordeal. And then at the very end, they're like, but we really would like it if you would still continue to go to church with us. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> yeah. wow. and I said, that's probably not going to happen. Yeah. And he said, okay. <laughs> All right. So that was how long ago? All right. So that would have been two years ago in January. Okay. And where did you go to church after that? Uh, nowhere. I haven't okay, been back that's, to church. So that's been, okay. that was it. <laughs> so that was it. kind of the last straw. But a lot of times what people do when they, when they have that opportunity, like I'm, I've stepped away and I'm kind of going to think for myself and I'm going to try to find my path. Yeah. They either get on the internet and 
you know, start looking, looking at some YouTubes or reading some books. Have you, have you YouTubed or, or read any of like the atheist movement stuff? I don't read a whole lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, like I said, I drive a truck, and so I listen to a lot of podcasts. Okay, what else have you listened to? Or um, do you... So I listen to y'all. I listen to uh, Drunk Ex Pastors. Yeah, so those guys are still Christians, <laughs> yeah, though. Yeah. One one of them is. One okay. of them is Catholic. The other one is atheist. Okay, yeah, I've listened to probably four or five episodes of that over the years. I mean, yeah, I, I really like like them. They're funny um, guys, yeah. For sure. Uh, the Thinking Atheist. Okay. Right. Seth Andrews. Did you ever Did you ever know him as a radio DJ in Tulsa? I did not. Okay, that, he used to be a Christian music DJ in Tulsa. Oh, wow. Well, this guy's got a great voice. Oh, he's got yeah. an amazing voice. Yeah. like a radio yeah. guy. He is a radio guy. Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah. So, yeah, he does The Thinking Atheist, and that's a great podcast. Okay, yeah. so this is where you kind of started uh, getting exposed this, to people that were ex-Christian, because yeah. Seth himself is well, ex-Christian. Yes, mm-hmm. and my ex-wife's brother was an atheist. You, you're is, calling your, her, your ex-wife, right? I mean, already. Yeah, yeah, might okay. as well. This, I mean, is, this is the only wife you've ever had, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So her brother, her brother grew up um, fully Christian, went to seminary, was a semester away from graduate graduating with a theology degree, mm-hmm. and I don't know exactly what made him turn, <laughs> but all of a sudden he just said, "This is all not right." Yeah. Like I don't, and so he was the first person I'd met that was that way, and I, I was always perplexed on how somebody with his intelligence could just have that switch flipped. Mm-hmm. You and, know, N- N- Nietzsche was the son of a Lutheran minister, and he mm-hmm. went to seminary in in effort to become a minister. Really? Yeah. And it was, it was after one or two semesters of seminary that Nietzsche w- walked away and said it, and then turned on it, you yeah. know, and, yeah. and became Antichrist almost. I mean, he has a book called Antichrist. So, but, yeah. so it, it happens, and yeah. that was shocking. So there's a couple of things here. You know, you, you leave the church, which... You know what we used to say, Hank, and you familiar with this, that, well, there's that Hebrews admonition that says, do not forsake the fellowship uh, yeah. of the brethren. Yeah. Christians would tell you, Hank, that you, of course you lost your faith because <laughs> you stopped the fellowship. In many ways, right. faith needs that weekly reinforcement, and if it doesn't have yeah. it, then it, it will on its own just die, yes. because it's, not, it's, it's artificially kept alive, like, you know... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Do not resuscitate, you know, type machines, <laughs> you know, the type of machines that keep yeah. a corpse alive. That's what I think church is, but that's right. that's just right. me being harsh. Yeah. Yeah. All right, listen, yeah. I'm going to let Hank talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, so I had, had had a few discussions with my brother-in-law then about that, just kind of trying to dig his brain and everything. And um, I had texted him recently, um, so I think he kind of knows something's going on. Sure. Um, yeah. Because he had told me about David Bazan. <clears throat> Oh yeah. And, uh, <laughs> so back then, when I listened to him, I couldn't hardly. Li- I was like, okay, this guy's really good, but it was that album "Curse Your Branches," sure. the one that he wrote when he came out of Christianity. Right. And I was just like, man, this guy, like, I I can't listen to this. But now, no, I understand. The last two months, I've probably listened to that album a hundred times. Yeah, that's interesting, and I think worth noting that when you're when you're still halfway in love with Jesus. Yeah. And you're kind of wishing that the whole God thing was true, even though you're having serious doubts. Yeah, you're still not ready to swallow yeah. that bitter pill. Like that's yeah. that's devastating to yes. to like the thing that has made life make sense, the thing that has made life beautiful, the th- yeah. the source of love and all morality. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this is like to you. You better be fucking kidding me. Yeah, <laughs> like this better not be untrue. Mm-hmm. Right, and so when so, you hear a song like "Curse Your Branches," where he's yeah. bashing, yeah, you know, there's a couple of songs in there where he's pretty hard on the God of of Noah, the God that would, yeah. the God mm-hmm. of genocide or whatever. Right, right, right. Mm-hmm. And well, you're talking about my buddy there, you know, and I knew that the first time I heard it was harsh, and and I know the first time I saw the cover of Christopher Hitchens' book at a bookstore, uh, "God Is Not Great." Yeah. I couldn't read it. I, yeah. You're talking about my friend. Oh. You know? Right, yeah. You're saying my, my yeah, friend like, is not great. Yeah. And I know that he is, so fuck it's, you. It's our whole life. Yeah. And yeah. I wasn't ready to yeah. read it until later, and then I fucking loved it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so now you're listening over over to Bazan. Oh, yeah. I mean, so he, your, your brother-in-law kind of knows. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Hank, I, think I, so. I, have, I have a question for you here. Yeah, now, yeah go ahead. So, so as I'm understanding this, the unkindness of, uh, you know, the people that you were working with acting, you know, they were very unkind to you, very disrespectful. I think they were cowardly, too. Cowardly, of yeah. course. Yeah. And... But it wasn't dogma. It wasn't about the notion of hell or virgin, right. you know, no. virgin birth or anything like that. That's what initially pushed you away. Right. Yeah. And you stopped right. going to church. Yeah, it was just this, my whole life, I have been supposedly going after this plan for my life that yeah. I was supposed to be this great worship leader. Uh -huh. And that, I mean, hell, that was prophesied over me at my church when I was like an elementary. I remember this one guy came in at our church. And I think my parents probably still have it on tape where yep. they prophesied. And, and this guy said that I had a voice. I was going to have a voice that just attracted people and that, you know, all this stuff about wow. what you would assume a great worship leader probably is going to be. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to take this path of like, OK, this is this is how I'm going to get there. And it seemed like which each step I took somehow it led to a dead end and I would just be like, okay, well that was the wrong way. And so then I would go and try this sure. other door and that was the wrong way. And wow. slowly but surely it just seemed like all the doors were closing mm -hmm. and it was just like, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Like somebody's trying to tell you something here. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, you know so I, I had a yeah. thing where my wife and when we, we were dating in high school huh. and I was not very popular in high school because I was a Christian. It had a lot to do with my really? judgment and how everybody felt judged by me. And so, oh, okay. like, they were out partying, and I was I was just a real strict Christian. And mm -hmm. and Mindy was by far the most beautiful woman that's ever graced that school, <laughs> let alone that year. <laughs> and literally everybody wants wants to date her. And when she started showing interest in me, you know, it Whoa. was just everybody was like, "That's crazy," and I just hit the jackpot with yeah. this beautiful woman. And I always was suspicious that it was a, a bet. <laughs> really? You know these mean girl said, movies go, or these Disney get, movies yeah. where huh. they, they dare somebody to date yeah. somebody? Okay, this is where I'm going. <laughs> All right. Is that the whole time I was with her, it was too good to be true. And I felt like at some point the bet was she would have made the bet. Right. She won the bet. She got me to date or whatever. And all these other guys in her class were, were paying her to do this, you know, right. and it was all going to come to, to a, the jokes on me. Right. You Point know? and laugh. Yeah. So I'm hearing Hank's story and he's, you know, the thing is, is as little children and I mean, we want to know and follow the meaning of life. And when someone, especially of, a, of authority, like your parent or a pastor or, yeah. or an adult of any kind almost tells you God has a plan for your life. Well, you want to line up with that plan. Yeah. You want to get in that 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 uh, trajectory that arc you know mm -hmm. that is yeah. divine for you and and so then when a prophet comes along because god is silent and the bible is sometimes ambiguous especially when it comes to specifics about me this is a guy who has like a hotline to god and <laughs> and this is powerful as hell like mm -hmm. this is really really powerful when cuz you want to know what god's saying yeah, And you want to know that you're in step with God's will. And when a prophet, who you've kind of ceded authority to, mm -hmm. says, thus saith the Lord. I mean, they right. literally talk first person, Bob. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm. I have a plan, you know, I have a plan for you. And, you know, and they'll say sweet things. And like you said, you know, her, Hank's parents probably have it on, uh, written <laughs> on down video, somewhere. Yeah, yes, something. Absolutely. Maybe even framed it and put it on the wall, you know. <laughs> I mean, I kept my prophecies. People yeah. would have prophesied over me. In fact, I may insert one here. No kidding. But, yeah, and they're very powerful, and they, they hold a lot of weight in your heart. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. Yeah. So some adult so, said that to you? Oh, they this said was, some things yeah. over me that basically predicted my future and, yeah. wow. and pointed to God's wow. anointing and that I had a special gift from God and yeah, that exactly. I was going to be used by God. So I want to insert here an excerpt from a prophecy that was spoken over me back in May of 2003 when I was a Christian, and I want to convey the power of prophecy. Hank was prophesied over, and it meant a lot to him. I was prophesied over. It meant a lot to me. And to the degree in which you regard the words coming out of the mouth of this prophet as literally or at least close to literally as possible the word of god that god is speaking and a lot of times it's in first person you'll hear some of this 
But in hindsight, Hank and I both, I shared this with Hank, and uh, we both agreed that a lot of the things that are said by these prophets, they can really touch something in what might be every human soul. Like, everybody would love to hear this. This is music to our ears. We would all love to know that God is in control, has a plan for our lives, and by hearing this prophecy, there's a part of us that is able to grab a hold of something and try to step into this prophecy, align our lives with it, and see how this plays out. It gives us hope. It gives us meaning. It's very powerful. So this is an excerpt from some of the, this prophecy that was prophesied over me uh, by a guy named Tom Moffat, who's a big pastor and motivational speaker in Houston, Texas. And I hear the Spirit of God saying that the economic word, a portion of that economic word, is for you. What was disordered and what was devastated at one level, I see an ordered road. I see a beautiful road. I see things that are coming together for your life. Let me just pray over you. And so, Cass, I believe that God is going to continue. And there came a worshiper. You are a worshiper of the Lord. And I get the word good stock. Good stock coming from good stock. And God is going to take and add abundant blessing to the good stock, Cass. And God is going to bring you up in the dimensions of the Lord. And he is, you are an orchestrator of you being able to bring things together. You're going to make things happen and bring things together. And I get an economic breakthrough, an economic breakthrough, an economic breakthrough, a removing of the pressure and the storms that are to come into your life. They're not storms of devastation, but the wind of the Spirit that's going to blow off the pressure. And that's what I see, the pressure being blown off. Why do I see somebody at the door making a demand and it causing pressure upon you and your wife, causing pressure upon your family? And the Spirit, I just feel like he's saying, I'm going to blow that away. He's going to blow that away. And there's economic order that is coming. And there's breakthrough that is coming as you continue to worship the Lord. And there is seeding that God is going to cause to come up, the seeding, as you seed the purposes of God, as you seed into others, great harvest is going to come. What do you do, Cass? You're a pastor? All right, good. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, what is the economic thing, Cass? I almost see it knocking at the door. Was there uh, something on the church, something related to your personal family? Well, I saw this picture, Cass. It was a tornado, the devastation, okay? I saw it coming down the road, and then I saw a road as beautiful. It was green and nice houses, and it speaks to me of where there is disorder, where the tornado blew. God is going to piece together, and he's going to bring together that order. And there is, and I associate it to uh, economic breakthrough, but there is just the ordering, the pressures coming through. The All right, let's just pray for you. Father, over the church, over this man of God, you guys extend your hands to him. Lord, the anointing. And as things come together, I speak and release the kingdom of God to Cass right now. I bless him. I bless his home. I bless his family. I bless his children. I bless his church. I bless him, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. And everything that has devastated, everything that was set, the storms that blew against him, now in the name of Jesus, there is another wind, the wind of the Spirit. There is another wind that is blowing in his home and in his life. And I command shame. And I command and guilt, and I command, Father God, the pressure of performance to go, and the pleasing of men, and the fear of men to be broken in the name of Jesus Christ. And I decree this day that the opinions of men do not press, and do not come against that which God has set. And Father, this man was set into the kingdom of God by the voice of God, and I see good stock, but the good stock did not set you. The good stock did not call you. The Spirit of God said, My son, I have called you by my Spirit before the foundation of the world. And do not doubt this, for I am in this season of your life going to give you increase of understanding and revelation knowledge. And no longer will you be able to function out of that which is just rational. There are things that will not meet the rational expectation and the rational mentality. And no longer will you be able to function even out of that which is intellectual and putting together good sermons and being able to pastor. I'm going to cause you to function out of a living, vibrant relationship, out of an anointing, out of prophetic dimension. 
and you will know that God has said it, God has done it, and there shall come an anointing upon your preaching and an anointing upon your teaching. O teacher of the word, O teacher of the word, there's going to come a prophetic anointing upon the teaching and an authority that the church has yet to see, says the Spirit of God. And there will be those who rise up against that which God has been calling you to. And I'm going to take this season and remove some and add others, says the Spirit of God. Do not freak out. Do not worry, for I am stirring this prophetic dimension inside of you. And it's going to come forward, and I'm going to open up your eyes to the revelation knowledge that God has for you, and I have for you, says God. I'm going to do this by my spirit and increase this anointing upon your life. Someone give God a hand in this. We're going to see that in the name of Jesus. Unquote. So you can see within this prophecy how he appealed to my heartstrings. Uh, financial pressure. He involved my wife and children. And he involved my teaching and, and my pastoral place and my skills and that God was going to energize and ignite that like I was it was it it, it, you can come away feeling energized and filled and hopeful that this was a word spoken by God God knows I exist number one God is watching and is concerned about my progress about my success as a pastor uh, my financial success as a family man and I, you know, I can just tell you, I can't, I, the reason that I even have this transcribed is I had the audio and I personally transcribed it myself. I posted it in my office and I would read it frequently in times of discouragement. Uh, and and it, it always encouraged me because it was proof, if you will, that God was on my side, that God was behind me, that God had my back. And uh, it was very, very powerful. So I just wanted to insert that here to give you an, uh, an idea, if you haven't ever had this experience, of what Hank's talking about. That when a prophet speaks over you, it has a very powerful effect uh, on your attitude and on your emotions. And then when you start to realize that the joke's on you, that the girl you've been dating was mm-hmm. paid to do it, <laughs> or, or something, you know, you think there's, yeah. some, there's something fraudulent about all this stuff that I have bought into hook, line, and sinker. And that is horrifying. Yeah. yeah. Like, if it were true, turned out Mindy loved me. <laughs> <laughs> but if it had been true, and, I, and all that time, all those secrets and intimacy and maybe even, you know, kissing of my wife, and then only to find out that she was laughing behind my back. Yeah. And that may be, I'm just saying that that may be kind of how it feels when you've bought this narrative that yeah. Hank, you're special, that Hank, you're God's you go. chosen, mm-hmm. that you've got this thing. And then to look at, to find out that it was not true. Right. <laughs> oh, ouch. Yeah. yeah. It's definitely um, very piercing, I guess, when, when you come to that conclusion. Yeah. When, you, when and if you're ready to actually come to that conclusion. And that's, that takes a lot right. of courage. Yeah, and you know the, the funny thing is, I uh, when I moved back here to my parents' house, I actually got in contact with the guitar player at my first church when I right when I got out of college, and um, we were real good friends then, and we kind of lost contact the last eight years or so that I've been away, and so I met back up with him. Well, he had gotten divorced and went through a real rough time, mm-hmm. and as it turns out, he is in the exact same position as myself. Wow as far as um, Christianity is concerned and spiritually. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. We were just sitting there drinking some whiskey, hanging out. Like, he didn't even know I drank whiskey. <laughs> and, like, that's a whole other thing, you know? I mean, sure. we're, yeah. So we're just sitting there drinking. All of a sudden we get to talking, and I'm, I kind of tell him, like, look, man, I, I'm like, I don't know how to say this, but I'm not the Hank that was the worship leader. At the, and he was like, you're not? And I was like, no. And we kind of got – and he was – and then – he was like, well, neither am I. And he kind of started telling me the stuff he went through and the stuff I went through. And what blew his mind, which I think made him feel a little better, he said, it makes me feel better about where my, this is him talking about myself, that a guy that grew up like you, like myself, just in church and constantly always, people assumed I had everything right. I did all the right things. I still arrived at the same conclusion as my friend who went down this path of drug addiction and all this other stuff, and we have come to the same conclusion, uh, or or going towards the same conclusion. I can't say I'm I'm there yet, but mm-hmm. 
we're still in the same spot. And he said, the fact that you can be in the same spot as me, he said, that means a lot. Yeah. And, um, well, because he yeah. could be, he could be feeling like I'm, I'm such a loser. I can't keep right. it. I can't hold it together. Right. But I don't no. have the strength that Hank does. And then to find <laughs> right. out that Hank doesn't have strength either. Yeah. The guy, <laughs> yeah, the guy that was his worship leader yeah. is now sitting here thinking, wow, like all this work I've done is just for naught, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. and it, this, and this guy did fall into drug addiction. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. He was in it before. I knew him like in high school, mm -hmm. and then when he got divorced, he got hooked back on pills, mm -hmm. and um and, and got out of it again, mm -hmm. luckily, and okay. uh, and now he just is not quite sure. He he's probably a theist. He thinks there's something out there, yeah, but he doesn't necessarily think that it it has a uh, a day to day interaction with your life. Well, no, that's deism. Poor, yeah. Okay, so that's deism. Yeah, yeah. theism so, is that he interacts in the affairs of man, humans. Okay, well, uh, yeah, and deism sorry, I, I'm, is. Uh, I may be more deism. Yeah, you, you, you sound like it. And deism mm -hmm. is just that there's a, a ground of being, that there's yeah. a source with a capital S. Yeah. And the, but it, it does not have a personality. It's not human right. in any way, right. shape, or form. Mm -hmm. And it's unknowable. <clears throat> and so, yeah. So just the other night, Thursday night, I went to his house and we were drinking again. And, <laughs> and he kind of. <laughs> so, well, that so that's, so that's kind of funny. We go, my parents have small group every Thursday night. And they have a group of people come over to the house. And so I always try to find something to do since I'm, I'm living here house. temporarily. Yeah. And they're always like, well, you can stay and eat. And I'm just like, uh, you know, I'll go find something to do. So once I got in contact with my friend again, we started having quote unquote small group. And I just <laughs> I just go to his house and we just drink a lot of whiskey. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, that can uh, open you up a little bit. And we <laughs> yeah. And we call it uh, RFLG, Real Fucking Life Group. <laughs> because... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, because you get in these small towns where these people they do their small groups and they talk about it's just doesn't seem like it's real stuff. Like these aren't real issues. You know, these aren't people that are. I hate to say that, but they're not dealing with real stuff. Like these small towns, they're so sheltered. Yeah, you know, their day is. I don't know. I mean, you know, I could talk about this forever. No, but I hear it you. Just, yeah, yeah, Lois's tulip mean. bulbs aren't growing. Yeah, yeah so, as well as they is. should. So yeah, he asked me Thursday. If I had to describe where I'm at right now, where would that be? And I said, well, honestly, I just thought of this the other day. I said, it's like <clears throat> my whole Christianity life is this big ship, and I am hanging over the edge, and I'm reaching for anything that I can to pull myself back on. I'm not finding anything, and I'm just getting tired of hanging on. Mm hmm Wow. That's, and, and it's sinking. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> and, and so I'm just like, I'm either going to just let go and see what happens and try to survive on my own or eventually I'm going to find a handrail or something and I'm afraid that's not going to happen but yeah so a lot of people when they leave they're not ready to just go from 0 to 100 miles an hour you know in right. the other direction right so there's what I used to call Oprah you know type spirituality transitional stuff where you're Deepak Chopra or you're and I still love um, Eckhart Tolle uh, mm -hmm. he I, he doesn't really have a lot of truth claims as much as he does just some theories and he's whack i mean they were, there's a degree in which he could be crazy but <laughs> but i've learned from him you know so but yeah. i don't he doesn't want me to follow him he doesn't no. want to start a religion just want you to buy his book yeah well, <laughs> with or without my help he's already yeah, multi, doing fine yeah yeah you know, but his idea about staying in the now yeah you know I the mean, power okay. of now yeah. yeah i mean saying yes to what is is part of what came from yeah. his theory nothing wrong with that in sure. fact he's a he's he borrowed a lot from nietzsche yeah know? so uh, there's some good shit there but anyway my point is is that i went to a unity church yeah. which is a jesus-based church but the, not not in the sense that god, jesus is god or god incarnate or died for our sins he's just a master teacher fallible like the rest of us yeah but we are when i asked a guy once i said do you guys believe jesus is god or jesus is the son of god and they, he said no more than you and i Oh, okay. So it's we kind of lower Jesus down to our humanity, but we raise ourselves up to his divinity. So uh, the, the the divine spark in all people, you know, oh, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. All right. Very so nice. that kind of rhetoric, you know, I, mm -hmm. that was a good transition stepping stone for me. Yeah. And then I just went, yeah, this is bullshit too. <laughs> <laughs> so you haven't really then, Hank, you haven't really, um, you know, looked, or hey, maybe you have looked deeply at uh, th this notion of hell the notion of the virgin birth, the rising into heaven, all those things that, that really... Yeah, where do you stand on doctrine? That's yeah, if you're really a Christian, you buy I, into that. I, I haven't quite... I haven't looked into it um, enough. 
you know, honestly, when, when I was a full on Christian, I, I didn't even look into it that much then. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, took, um, it for, took it at its word. It, yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't all that important to me because I was going to heaven anyways. Yeah. Mm. So kind of selfish of you, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, because well, yeah. it really you know, focuses on you. Really, it does. Well, and you're, about it, you're you know? ignoring yeah. the fact that millions are going to burn. So yeah. Whatever. Yeah. And like, you know, this this small town Christian outlook, mm-hmm. nobody focuses on the bad or weird shit. Mm-hmm. No. It's just you're going to heaven. You know, you're a Christian. You do what's right. You know, you try to save people. And so doctrine there's not a whole lot there as far as learning about it. Mm-hmm. And so I find myself right now, even I'm just not worried about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, and I don't know. I mean, somebody that is, I got, I mean, I'll use the term loosely, I guess more intellectual than myself. I mean, I just, I don't focus so much on that kind of stuff. You know, maybe that, maybe that's more of a uh, pillar for them, but it, it just doesn't seem all that important to me. So I don't know where I stand as far as that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just know, as I hear those stories, I'll give you one example. My dad was listening to a YouTube video, it was some old gospel song about the story of Daniel. Uh-huh. I mean, story of uh, David. And okay. they were talking about David in the lion's den. No, that's, no Daniel. That's Daniel. Daniel. Yeah. yeah. See, I'm already forgetting stuff. That's, that's good. good. That's, <laughs> okay. good. Yeah, that's, that's good. <laughs> Daniel in the lion's den. And it's, it's just a story about that. And, it, and the chorus is talking about, you know, Daniel's in the lion's den and God shut the mouth, blah, blah, blah. And my dad's sitting there just like bobbing his head, just really enjoying it. And he turns to me and he said, this is good. And I said, it's good. And he was like, yeah, it's good because this really happened. This is real life. Oh my. Yeah. And I just kind of sat there. I was taken back a little bit and I was like, man, I really believed that. And I'm sitting here now thinking, I don't know if I really do. Yeah, right. Well, you kind of just described, you were describing the mentality of the town. That You said they basically just don't care about the details. And I I know that's true of my town. In fact, and I don't mean this to say, oh, this is for simple-minded people or whatever, but to some degree it's for all of us because we're all lazy, and I think sometimes simplicity just feels better, and that is... To, to a small town person like myself, like Hank, like all these people yep. that we're talking about, the fact that God is exists and is the source of all things is a given. Yeah, exactly. No, even, Done. That's it. No question. No, it's not even, there's not a doubt in your mind that all of this is the creation right. of God. Even to the people that aren't like fully Christian, if you're exactly. in that small town. It's just a given. It's just... That's just true. It's whether assumed, you want to believe it or not. Yeah, and it's locked <laughs> up into the like that nobody's even nobody. That's not anywhere close to being brought into question. Right. Safe right. and sound. Right. This is God's planet. Now, right. the details of how he did it, how right. what he wants, what he thinks. Right. Did Daniel actually survive a lion's den? Right. All of the details. Nah. Meh. Exactly. <laughs> Meh. <laughs> Meh. It just doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> the big picture, God's in control. I trust that. End of sentence. End of conversation. That's true. That's no the more. In fact, don't bother me with that shit <laughs> because I don't care and I don't have the capacity or maybe even the 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 brain uh, stamina to right. engage in a and and I every time I've ever engaged in a conversation with somebody about that, it it always ends in in either a disagreement or no. it, we, it's futility. So shut up. God's mm-hmm. in control. It's that's a that's yeah. a small town mindset. Yeah, wow. exactly right. Wow. All right. So one of the things that came up <sighs> was that you um, you're having these one on ones with your buddy every week. Yeah. Uh, your parents know that you're living with them because you're in the middle of a separation. Yeah. They don't know you're in the middle of separating from Jesus, too. <laughs> Nobody does, it sounds like, except maybe I think, this guy. I think my mom probably has an inkling of it. but Okay, that you're having a faith crisis at the same time. Yes, as you're... yeah, because she's sending me emails and articles and stuff. <laughs> With scriptures. Yeah, she sent me this one just recently about uh, a season of pruning. Yeah. And uh, when, you, when you're going through all this time of loss... Mm-hmm. Uh, you're, you're not a failure. You're just being pruned. You know, you're getting rid of the stuff, and it's going to be better. And yeah, well, bless her heart. I mean, it, you have to oh, know, and I'm sure you do, Hank. That her heart is breaking too. Oh, for sure. She anytime, absolutely... yeah. Anytime a parent, their their children are hurting. For it doesn't matter what the reason is, they're hurting right. too. Right. No. She. Yeah. She has all the good in the world. Absolutely. So. She's doing the. She's yep. basically. What can I do to help my son? And this exactly is her. Right. This is her attempt. But yeah, nobody nobody really knows except for a couple friends. Yeah. 
But, uh, boy, this is going to be tough. This is going to be tough for everybody. You know, one of the other friends I went to Bible college with actually is, is on the same level as me, but he lives in California. I just went on a road trip and visited him. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were drinking and having some fun there. Um, <laughs> That's kind it. of a go-to thing for you there. <laughs> oh, hey? yeah, for sure. We got into a little bit more than that, but we're sitting there in this hotel that I rented in downtown San Diego, and he said, man, he said, I would have never imagined that both of us, after graduating Bible college, now we're both here yeah. drinking and talking about how we don't believe any of this. Man, I've had that conversation many times, and I know many of our listeners have. And this is significant because <laughs> one of the things, and this is the reason why we started the show. Yeah. One of the things is that when you're going through a personal crisis of faith and you're personally, yeah. like you said, you're trying to hang on to that ship and it's just, right. there's nothing to grab and you're, you're looking at, mm-hmm. you know, falling into a shark, you know, yeah. infested, infested sea, sea yeah. or trying to get back on the ship and yet there's nothing to grab. Oh, it's, it's very tough. And you feel completely it's, alone. It's not, like you just said with this friend, it's not even in your imagination that your your peers that you went to Bible college with are going through yeah. that. It's just me. Yeah. And then when you kind of get the courage to share with the friend, hey, I'm having some doubts. My God, me too. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, it's huge. And, it it yeah. means a lot. Yeah. And you know, I, I wish, like, I don't know how much this would help anybody or, I mean, my situation, because I, I can't pinpoint, you know, when you're asking me what, what was the catalyst, whatever. Yeah. There doesn't seem to be any major things that it just... Over the years, I guess it just, mm. and I don't know how many people go about it that way. It seems like a lot of people y'all interview. There's some pretty major stuff that goes on in people's lives, mm. and I really haven't had that. No, it's it's a death of a thousand cuts. <laughs> we we talk a lot about the little things. It, yeah. Well, here's the other thing: is we're not talking about a steel girded scaffolding that is solid. And we're talking about a house of cards. Yeah. So when we say, what was the catalyst? It doesn't have yeah. to be a battering ram. Yeah. It could be a little right. breeze. Yeah. <laughs> this well, it, is a yeah. weak construct. Yeah. yeah. It reminds me of a, a, a lyric in one of those songs from David Bazan that says, uh, digging up the root of my confession, if no one planted it, how did it grow? Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. I, I go to that one a lot because I try to think back of, I didn't, I didn't plant anything for me to all of a sudden believe or start going down this trail. Okay, let's talk about that because I'm a little. <laughs> I, I love poetry. I love David Bazan, and I'm okay. I'm a little mystified by what that means. So let's talk about. So when he says, "When I dig up the root of my confession," he's talking about when he. I'm, conf- I'm sorry, confusion, not confession. Oh, sorry. Okay. Confusion. So digging up the root of my confusion. All right, now that makes more sense. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's cool. When I dig up the root of my confusion, what's the next line? Uh, no one planted it. How did it grow? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. So we and don't I mean, necessarily, you know, when we're trying to find the catalyst, yeah. it's like, it just... And and one little, I want to read y'all something that, that I wrote uh, that kind of oh. falls along those lines, um, if y'all don't mind. No, no please. Not at all, please. Uh, so this this is like, this is a, a verse in one of the songs, because I've I wrote a few songs. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you about that if you're a songwriter, too. Yeah, yeah. I, I used to write, obviously, a lot of Christian songs. Uh, I haven't in a long time. Um, now I write a lot of songs that probably I can't be played until I, <laughs> until I uh, come clean with everything. But uh, mm-hmm. so this the second verse in this one song it just says, um, "In these hands was a book I was never shaken, never stirred. Nowadays all I do is use it to get out of weird situations. I'm done following your better plan. When I think that it's dumb, you convince me there's a better way. Just a little life lesson. And so." Basically, that song is just about that coming out, you know, that transition. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, because more, t- more, I mean, it's happened in this house where they've been talking about different things, and I'm having to just fake along with it. Like we had to pray for a friend that was at the house, and like my dad's like asking me to pray for these people. And, like, so I'm just kind of faking it because, mm. like I said in the in that lyric, you know, it's a weird situation. So I'm just going to use this to get out of the situation so I don't cause any controversy. Yeah, um, I get it. So and the, then my, the book in your hands. Yeah, the, yeah. I was talking about the Bible. Yeah, it yeah. used to be the all in all, and now yeah. you just use it when right. you, when you kind of are in a in a jam yeah. or something. I was I was never shaken or stirred from my belief back uh-huh. then. Yeah, 
but now all that book for me right now is just to uh, avoid having to <laughs> tell people well, what's going on. I've got on. a little heads up for you. When when and if you'd come out in years past, uh-huh. uh, your mom or people that knew your music or knew your saw your anointing, quote unquote, yeah. they are unknowingly and naively going to bring those songs up and rub them in your face. Now, I say not, they don't know they're rubbing it in your face, but it's going right. to hurt and it's going to... Yeah. It's gonna feel weird for my, yeah. you know, my mom. She'll just say, "You remember that song you wrote about the Holy Spirit?" <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, mom." Yeah, I've and got she a knows I don't believe it anymore, but she right. wants so badly for me to return to that guy. The guy that wrote that song is my son. Right. Who right. are you, and what have you done with him? Right. <laughs> and so, I, as I am now, I'm not really acceptable. Yeah, mm. and you want that old guy back? And if I were to pull up that song, I can do it. I mean, it's in my head. If I were to sing that song, I mean, it's not like I care. It's not like it stings for me to sing mm. that song. I can sing it just like I could sing "Row Your Boat." <laughs> um, but the fact that you keep missing that guy and you're in in, in an indirect way, I feel the rejection of that. Yeah, and so yeah, that's what makes it painful for me when people say, "Well, literally, somebody posted." A video of them singing one of my songs in in church the other day. Oh wow! Oh boy! And people are still singing my songs in church. Wow! And uh, I don't, I don't, I still get. I don't haven't gotten one in years. But I, for a while, I got a royalty check from a song that a, a, <laughs> a band cut. Huh? A song called "The Victim," and it was basically substitutionary atonement gospel. Yeah, mm. right. And uh, I don't believe any of that anymore. I don't believe yeah. a fraction of like. There's no. If I were to go through my lexicon of songs, there's probably six sentences that might still be true to me, you know, as far as love one another or whatever. Right. Anyway, wow. so that that's coming. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. I can look forward to that, huh? Yeah, look forward to that. Well, if you oh, stay on yeah. this path, I think so. Yeah. But yeah. It's, it's little steps all the time. Yeah. And it would right. be interesting to have you back in a, I don't know, a year or so. I'd say see, five years. <laughs> okay, and see where you are, you know? Oh, yeah, I would love changing. to, yeah. So in the some of the transition authors in the Christian world, like Brian McLaren or uh, Rob Bell, uh-huh. have you read any any those uh, types of progressive Christian books? Yeah, a little bit of Rob Bell, and I listened to his uh, Life After God podcast as well. Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah. Well, it, no, that's Ryan Bell. Yeah, that's Ryan, Ryan Bell. Bell. Yeah, yeah, keep mixing people. But Rob Bell, yeah, I've read some of his stuff. Yeah, love love wins. Oh, I see. Yes. Okay. Yeah. See, that's one of the best Christian deconstructions of hell out there. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm, for that's sure. a that's a killer for a lot of people, and he's yeah. a heretic, you know. Oh yeah. Absolutely. By many, <laughs> but actually, he's he's taken the high road. He's taken the way of love, and mm. yeah. hell is the worst idea that any human, and that's all ideas ever have come from. There is right. no God. To, right. to birth ideas. <laughs> so some motherfucking human came up with that. And yeah. it has been the most destructive ideology to ever enter the human mind and then pass down generation after generation. Yeah. Because as long as somebody can hold in their heart and mind a acknowledgement that certain people deserve eternal torture, that forms the biggest callus on a on a otherwise soft and pliable human heart yeah and so racism anytime that you can disregard the other that was not necessarily created but the the type of callous that a human heart can form to become a hateful bigoted racist or misogynist or Mm -hmm. or xenophobe is fueled and compounded by the concept of hell that is subconsciously inserted into the west everybody Mm -hmm. knows it everybody slightly believes it and it has completely, like, I would say one of the reasons why we aren't a more mature species of, like, <laughs> to where wars are completely in our rearview mirror, it would be unthinkable for us to ever go to war because we've learned how to solve problems diplomatically. Mm-hmm. The reason that we haven't matured as a species to that point is hell. Hmm. So oh, that's so it's, it's tragic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's... Thank you, Christianity. Thank you. <laughs> it's not Judaism, by the way. Right. No, no, they don't. It is Christianity. It is Jesus. Jesus is the introducer of the yeah. worst concept to ever fuck up the the, mm. the maturation and the progress of the human species. Hmm. There you go. Speech over. <laughs> yeah, really. All right, let's go to light stuff. Um, what is okay. your uh, 
What is your earliest memory of feeling awe and wonder? Probably getting baptized. Really? Yeah. Coming up out of the water with goosebumps. Yep. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. And again, believing like, oh my God, I've just been touched by the Spirit. That was one of those pinnacle moments, you know, as far as when you grow up with that. Mm-hmm. That's one of those deals that, that, that means, you know, everybody's up there watching and you come out and everybody's clapping and, you know, you're probably 10 years old or something. And Wow. But, yeah, for sure. Uh, what about <laughs> uh, you go to movies very often or? Uh, no, not a big movie goer. I, I like to wait until they come out on Netflix. <laughs> okay, well, like what do you that. watch? What do you, what kind of movies do you watch though when you eventually watch? Uh, them? mostly comedy. I really like comedy movies. Okay, I like to, to zone out and just. <laughs> Dude, I give... totally relate. I totally relate. <laughs> so, so and and TV shows. What um, some? What are some of the comedians or shows that that you that come to mind as far as uh, really made you laugh? Yeah, some of the great ones like uh, Anchorman. Oh yeah, oh sure. Big fan yeah. of Anchorman. Um, and as far as TV shows, uh, I really enjoyed Shameless. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's William H. Macy again. Yes. Yeah. And uh, Walking Dead, Breaking Bad. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, those kind of shows. Those aren't comedies, but they're, they are funny. Right. Those, I mean, yeah. Those are, yeah. Those aren't the comedies. Um, Shameless is pretty funny, though. It's a comedy, I guess. Yeah. It is. It's a tragic Dark comedy. Tragic, tragic comedy. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, what are you most proud of? What are, of your accomplishments in life, what are you most proud of? Man, that's kind of tough. Yeah. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe keeping a, a handful of friends that I've had my whole life. Yeah, that's an accomplishment. Um, yeah, they. Uh, th- there's a few of them that have been with me for the whole ride. They know where I'm at now. They knew where I was at then, mm. and uh, they're still right there. So, I, and I, oh, that's gold. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty proud of that. Actually, well, and it's and keep those people. Mm. I mean that. I mean, because so often. When people yeah. follow your trajectory, they say, "No, I can't. I can't follow you down this path." Right, right. And they cut. I've, phew, I've got <laughs> no, I, several yeah. that have done that to me. Yeah, right. Yeah. So yeah. for no, somebody I've... to say, "I'm with you," and uh, I'm hanging tough, and let's go, let's do this together, or golly, yeah. I've got a couple that actually said they like me better now. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah. <laughs> well, of then, course. Then, you know, these are kids or friends from high school, so you know. They they tell me that they like me better now because I seem just uh, a lot more fun, I guess, a lot more free. So probably more accepting, more yeah. Than so that was interesting. Quotes. That was kind of a revelation. So yeah. so growing up, did you are you one of those that only listened to Christian music and not secular? No, I listened to secular. Good um, for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, not me. I was one of those that parsed yeah. it off as yeah separate. No, I would, and in fact, I got in trouble for listening to secular music when I was in Bible college. Right, that's what I'm saying. I was a part of that so. crew. Yeah. <laughs> so, what are some? Of, what are some like when you on your iP- iPad or iPhone? What are some of your songs? The playlist, I guess. The <laughs> artists. Uh, I listen to a lot of uh, punk. Not like I mean, not the newer punk like uh, Ramones or sure. uh, really. Listen to yeah. That's I, interesting. I re- I really like that. Any um, metal at all? Doing metal? Yeah, or? I listen yeah. to um, Machine Head. Um, <laughs> uh, I have a pretty eclectic, like my the if people look at my playlist, they're gonna be like you know they have like I said Machine Head. You're gonna have like Rise Against, then you're gonna have uh, Johnny Cash, <laughs> and you're you know you're gonna have uh, Blink One Eighty Two. Yeah, you, sure. You know. Last night I was the MC of a fundraiser with that had three heavy, heavy metal bands on. No kidding. And I'm not a heavy metal guy, but I I had earplugs and everything, and I, <laughs> which is actually in a live setting. I mean, I would I would do that for any genre, but yeah. It, yeah. but especially metal. But because yeah. you can really hear the singer. Yeah. Because yeah. like the harshness of the snare and the harshness of the guitar is a little muffled by the earplugs. Okay. Yeah. And actually, I can so understand the words of the singer better with earplugs. So anyway, it was interesting, uh, and I'm a I'm a drummer, and I I, oh, well, I yeah. never was like a metal drummer, but right. I'm freaking amazed at the double bass. Oh, they're spectacular! Oh, the way they do that? Yeah. I mean, you like that kind of stuff? It was like <laughs> I can I can listen to it. I'm not I'm not going to sit there and chill out to it. But, oh yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> but I can admire the talent that it takes. Yeah, to, that, me too. To do that. Oh my too. gosh, that's some fast um, feet. Yeah, that's for sure. And as far as like when I play my own stuff, it would probably fall under. Uh, more so like a Texas country or a red dirt country kind of style. Yeah. Uh, it's not really country mainstream. I'm not a big fan of what Nashville would consider country. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of poppy now. It's yeah, it's kind of stupid. Into, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so guys like uh, Chris Stapleton and oh, Jason, yeah. Jason Isbell and 
American Aquarium. Those are kind of the country bands that I, I kind of Dude, get you've got tremendous taste. Uh, I've got a guy that is one of my best friends here in town, and he's just a connoisseur of music. And you oh, just... Yeah. You, you're talking about a lot of the same things that he is, and wow. uh, and I really respect his ear. Yeah, uh, I don't have that kind of scrutiny that he does, but he right. he, he likes those those same bands that you just listed. Yeah, cool, outstanding. Um, wow. So you're going through a divorce. You're yeah. having to live at home for a while. You're still driving a truck for the oil industry. Yeah. You're, are you playing that much? I mean, I know sometimes people put their instruments down when they leave the church. No, I, you know, in fact, I haven't. Um, my plan is once I move back to Amarillo, um, the music scene is obviously a lot better there. Sure. I will start playing. I haven't even started playing my stuff out live yet. I mean, uh -huh. the only playing I really did was in the church. Mm -hmm. And because I was so busy with my work, it was hard to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. We're a little slow right now, you know, the oil business is kind of slow right now, so mm -hmm. I have a little bit more time, and I think I could do it. Mm -hmm. um, so as soon as I get back to the bigger city, I, I believe I'll start playing more. Um, yeah, and you know, when you get back to Amarillo, too, uh, just check, our, check around online. I bet you that you'll find some atheist group or some, you know, humanist, oh, I'm sure. humanist group thinkers. or some free thinkers yeah. or yeah, I'm something. Sure. And, uh, you know, you can hang out with people that, <laughs> that'll make you feel good. Yeah, yes. and it yeah. sounds like you have some of those. Are those people in Amarillo that you mentioned a while ago? Uh, one of them will be, yes. Yeah. One of them that he he was in the army. This is a whole nother friend, and and he's along there with me. Um, he kind of believes. I, I wouldn't say he is exactly where I am, but well, nobody he, is. Uh, We're all right. in a different place. Right, right. It's and, cool. Uh, but we hang out quite a bit, and I feel totally free with him. And we've talked about a lot of stuff. So, yeah, I've got a handful of friends. I mean, I'm not alone in this. Like I've heard some of the people talk about how they just have nobody. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so who filed so, you? You or your wife? Uh, I'm I'm going to. I haven't quite yet. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're looking for you're looking forward to closure there. Yeah, I uh, wish your heart breaks over and you're kind of moving on. Yeah, I'm kind of you know I'm kind of a black and white person where I don't. Yeah. I, well, I say that with everything, but <laughs> except for my uh, Christianity that that seems to be taking a little longer than normal. But Getting colorful, yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, as far as the divorce goes, I, I wish you know once we decided to do it, I wish we could have just done it because yeah. we just kind of hang here and you know yeah. she's living four hours away, so it makes it kind of hard, but. It's going to happen, you know, within the next week. I think I'm going to go ahead and just file and just get, get it done. Yeah. And you just grew apart, right? You just both evolved you know, into different people or what happened? Like I said, she had come to me a handful of times in our first three or four years and just saying that it just didn't feel like it was working. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't ever put my finger on what. And I would ask her, I said, well, you know, what's not working? Well, I don't know. We just don't feel close. And it's like I was working 70 hours a week. And she was working almost 60. She was a general manager of a restaurant. Oh, that's hard. Yeah. And, wow. you know, she was working nights and I'd come home and she, you know, we didn't really see each other a whole lot. Yeah. She would work weekends and I'd be off, you know, vice versa. And we basically were just roommates. And mm -hmm. uh, so when she would say, you know, things aren't working, so I, we would try to make it better and we would try to do stuff and and we would get going again. And then she'd come to me again and then she'd come to me again and... um this last time she came to me, we had already been living separate because I was still trying to finish working on the house and get it sold. And uh, she, we had already lived separate for nine months. And uh, mm. we got the house sold, and I moved to Hartley because I, I only needed two more months at my current job, and I was going to reach five years, which I would get a few um, monetary bonuses with that. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to move to Hartley for two months, get my bonus, and then move and, you know, we can be together again. And she said, okay, that sounds good. But right after we sold the house, within two weeks of living here, she called and, or she texted and uh, said things weren't working out again. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. There's no shame in that, I guess. I mean, it just didn't no. work out. Yeah. And and I, I can't pinpoint what it was. Uh, she, she would just tell me that I changed. I wasn't the same person that I was when we dated. Yeah. I, yeah, I probably have. So whatever I'm going through must have been leaking out in some way <laughs> yeah. for people to notice some type of change. And maybe maybe my wife did not uh, like what she saw. I don't know. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it just, it loses. I mean, we always say the phrase, the honeymoon's over. I mean, there is, a, yeah. there is it loses its sparkle and you kind of have to either I buckle just, down and just yep. become kind of roommates and friends and life yep. shares. And it's not all, you know, 
mm-hmm. romance I've, like the movies or something. But <laughs> I think if we had still had been living together, mm-hmm. we, I probably would have fought through. Mm-hmm. But this time it was going to require me to quit my job and move. Yeah, and it's, it's a little bit, you know, as far as you don't have kids and there's probably not a whole right. lot of assets to divide. No, and no so we it's sold probably the house. Be pretty, mm-hmm. It's just you pretty much sign the papers and you're done. So I, it's probably the best thing. Yeah, I think so. I mean, not none of my business, but <laughs> from a distance, it sounds like you got it, got it going. Yeah, it, yeah, it's gonna be fine. I mean, I, I, I'm, I would be lying if I said I hadn't thought about it. But like I said, it wasn't an option when you were brought up the way I was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And actually, my parents took it pretty well. I was surprised on how well they took it because yeah. I figured they would be all over me to go to counseling or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But they actually were kind of like, I think they didn't want to see me move, probably. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, thanks, Hank, for telling your story. I, I really appreciate it, and I think it'll be encouragement to people. And, you know, you well, are, you're midstream still, you know, so I wish you the much best. So. Uh, I think you're on the back end, though. I mean, I think you're you're moving on. I think you're right. And you sound healthy. I don't, you know, the thing is, is when people are burned by the church and stuff like that, or we're even disappointed in ourselves or embarrassed that we yeah. ever believed it, I don't, I don't sense a lot of angst or animosity or, or no. venom in your voice. The, there's been times where I've I've been a little more upset than not. Um, well, yeah, you got to say every now and then you got to say, well, fuck those guys. Right. <laughs> That's fine. But, but then you move on. In In the big scheme of things, these last two years, like I said, I hadn't been back. I've been back to church once, and it was for Mother's Day. Mm-hmm. But in the last two years, I hadn't been back to church. And quite honestly, and I've even told my mom this, I was like, I've never enjoyed my life more than when I didn't have that responsibility of going to church. Yeah. Wow. Like, I don't know what it is. And, and she she actually understands. She was kind of jealous of that fact because, I mean, she's been a worship leader her whole life. She's like, I can't just not go to church. And I'm like, yeah. well, I couldn't either. You know, for 10 years, it was my job. And now, you know, Sunday morning, I, I, I talk to y'all. So <laughs> That's right. Nice right. to sleep in. <laughs> so, so tell me this. What is the desired life and plan and vision for Hank? I mean, what do you want to do? You want to go back to college? What do you want to do? No, I don't think I would go back to college. Um, the, the thing I want most right now is I want to get back to Amarillo, and I want to start playing music. Amarillo mm. by morning. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I've always, that's always been a dream of mine. Yeah. Uh, I've always worked a lot. I mean, I'm, I come from a blue collar family. I still work a lot. Um, but on top of that, I was in the church. And so that didn't allow me a lot of other time to play. And, you know, if I were playing on the bars on Saturday night and then going to church Sunday morning to, to worship, I don't know how well that would have worked out. Yeah, but it's uh, hard. So that's my plan is just to get back, continue, you know, driving truck. You know, I got to make a living and then, but just start playing music just for the hell of it. I mean, yeah, that yeah. sounds good. Do that's it. great. And I think you're smart to keep your day job. I mean, every, oh, well, there's, I, I yeah. moved to this town to play drums for a living and uh, you have about as much chance of breaking it in big <laughs> as you do making the NBA. I right. Mean, yeah. So have, yeah. have your day job on the, on yeah. the side, but, but by all means, follow your heart and follow yeah. your bliss. You know, I, I don't expect anything um, awesome to happen. I just, you know, I think I told you all earlier, I just, I've lived my whole life going after this supposed plan for my life. Yeah. And I told my buddy the other night, I said, right now, I, I'm tired of, I'm tired of doing that. Like, I just mm-hmm. want to yeah. live something I want to live. Like, I'm not necessarily just chasing after this invisible mm-hmm. finish line in a sense. Okay. So repeat after me, Hank. <laughs> there is no plan. There is no plan. Uh, and that, that doesn't that just open up? I mean, it's scary at first, but then it opens up to where, oh, it's a it's a clean right. slate. Yeah. Right. And yeah. I, I get to I get to write out my life. I mean, as much yeah. as I have the power to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But making choices like that to say, I'm gonna go out and play my songs and on yep. open mic nights or writers' nights or clubs, right. you know, that'll let me let me sing my songs. Yep. And see that's, where that takes us. That that's what I'm gonna do. There you go. Sounds great. That's just man. it. And and drink a lot of whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I am a big whiskey connoisseur. So I, yeah. yes, I <laughs> if you couldn't tell. What are you drinking? What's are you drinking Jack or is it uh man, I drink a lot of different stuff. Um one of my favorites is called Angel's Envy. Angel's Envy. I've never heard yep. of that. And uh, it's one of my favorite bottles of whiskey. Um huh. that one, um Bullet Bourbon is another favorite. Uh, I will drink Jack, but I tend to, I wouldn't say my tastes are a little higher than that. Oh, but. sure. <laughs> no, I understand. Jack is I like the Budweiser Jack. of, of yes. bourbons, you know. So, yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I'm going to go out and buy Angel's Envy. I would love I, to taste it. I would just and buy Bob and I will, the other day. We'll toast to you. Hey. Well, <laughs> yeah, bring it's it over. great stuff. I mean, it's it's kind of mid-range, and uh, it's uh, it's just a great whiskey. I just love it. So. Sounds good. All right, man. So, well, yeah. We wish you the best, and uh, keep in touch. Yeah, Hank. Yeah, I'll keep listening for sure. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Talk man. soon. Thanks. So, all right. Thank you all. Mm-hmm. Hank Vincent. So 29 years old, going through a divorce, has some dreams, mm-hmm. and is kind of thinking for himself and dreaming for himself as opposed to pursuing God's dream for him. Mm-hmm. I think the future's bright for him, really. Me too. I get that sense. When he said it was like I'm hanging on to the boat, you know, and it's going down, or it's, it's uh, I can't, I need an extra rung to hang on to, you know, I thought he is finally poking his head into this notion of critical thinking. He's finally looking around yeah. and and saying, you know, if this doesn't happen, then I'm, I'm going a different direction. Yeah, so. well, he took things that appeared before him, mm-hmm. like dysfunctional church politics. Mm-hmm. And instead of continuing to buy into the line, well, don't look at people, keep looking at Jesus. Yeah. He actually started to say, well, wait a second. Hold on, yeah. This is so dysfunctional and so just like people outside the church. Right. That what if this thing that we think is the uh, everything changes when you get filled with Jesus, (laughs) what if it's nothing changes and he began to entertain the notion that, wait a second, that prophet that prophesied over me, That's or amazing. even just the whole notion that God exists and has a plan for my life, what yeah. if all of this is nothing, is meaningless, doesn't exist? Mm-hmm. And that's such a hard, bitter pill to swallow yeah. that I do not hold it against him or judge him for mm-hmm. going slow and maybe baby stepping yeah. and to where it's like I'm still hanging on to there might be a God. Yeah. Go for it, man. I mean, there's no judgment. Yeah. When people are trying to find their own spiritual path, there's no judgment. Yeah. When he was talking about uh, his dad listening to the music about uh, uh, Daniel in the, in the Den, I thought, you know, when I went to see Passion of the Christ, mm-hmm. the movie, yeah. Mel Gibson's movie, uh, the movie ended and a couple of women stood up and said, you know, that's exactly the way it was. That was like a, I was watching a documentary or something. And that's like, what? Yeah. You know, that's that's what struck me. Uh, people embrace these things yeah. literally so closely. Yeah. And, uh, and he had that experience as well. Absolutely. So. Well, the God of the gaps is just that. If there's a gap where we don't really know how it happened or what happened on Calvary or the mm-hmm. last seven days of Jesus is whatever. I think it was the last 24 hours is what yeah, that movie right, was. Right. And so people don't like question marks or doubts or, or emptiness. It's a vacuum. You know, it's got to be mm. filled. And they stood up and said, thank you, Mel Gibson, for filling that gap. Yeah, I guess they did. Because it feels good. To, oh, now I know that's how it happened. Yeah. It feels good. It's comforting. Yeah. God and, of the gaps is comforting. And violent man. Oh, well, yeah. I mean. <laughs> Brutal. What's about, what's about, what about love? Why don't we talk about love instead of all this? But, you um, know, it's more show business. No, Bob. You, I mean, I don't know if you want to go there, man, but <laughs> honestly, I wrote a song inspired by that movie. Yeah. That was all about love. Oh. And. Um, so you picked up a, a little love thing. Huh? Well, you let them break you. Oh, I see. He's he, talking about Jesus. Yeah. He's he's tied to the whipping post and getting shredded. Right. When he said it is finished, the question for me was, "What is finished?" Because mm-hmm. that's his last words before he breathed his last, you know, mm-hmm. on the cross. And the, what was finished was the wrath of God towards humanity's rebellion against Him. Mm-hmm. And instead of sending us or beating us or torturing us. He did it to his own son. So it's a courtroom scene to where the judge has pronounced guilty as charged, life in, life in hell, life in prison. Mm-hmm. And somebody steps up and says, I'll, I'll serve their term. Mm-hmm. Substitutionary atonement. Yeah. And so it's that brutality and all that violence you saw was not absent of love. Mm-hmm. That was love. That was him saying, I love you this much. Oh, I see. See how you can spin it? 
Yeah, you can spin it that way. I suppose so. So I'm just telling you. I mean, it's yeah. that's you know sometimes you like to get inside the head of the Christian. Yeah, that's absolutely. how that's how we spun that, that to you be because you you basically were saying where's the love? Well, that yeah. whole movie to a Christian was love. <laughs> oh my See? okay right you know and i do have a couple of things to tell hank uh, if you're if you're sitting in a truck and you listen a lot to uh video bo- you know books on tape or or uh d- podcast download podcasts or, yeah. or whatever uh get sam harris's first book end of faith uh-huh. that book is i think in my opinion the mm-hmm. best of of the bunch yeah so end of faith listen to that one Audible, you just download it from Audible or yeah. go online. Anything by Bart Ehrman yeah. uh, is is uh, great. Yeah, if you care Any about the, the f- biblical scholarship, he doesn't seem to care about yeah. the biblical scholarship. But, but that I think kind of stuff is helpful. Yeah, and I I would – it's a close tie for me between uh, God is not great, Christopher Hitchens, and, and – Yeah, but I will say, Hitchens, him too. I will say that Sam Harris's book, End of Faith, is more accessible than Hitch. Yes, because Hitch is a genius. I mean, like, and so is Sam. But at least he his rhetoric and the, his choice of words and the way he frames stories yeah. are much more accessible than Hitch. Yeah, because Hitch is Hitch is well, he's European for one thing. So there's a little bit of a different yeah paradigm. True. But yeah, but yeah, Sam Harris would be great. Sure. Yeah. So that's uh, that's all I got to say on that. Good show. Interesting. Very yeah. interesting guys. Yeah. Yeah. All right, man. Do it again. Let's do it. <laughs> see you see, next week. See you. Bye bye. So I'm here with my friend, and you are my friend. You're one of my best yes. friends in town. We, we we share this little town of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. We're in the book club together that's kind of evolved into something different, but right. still very much a, a tight-knit group of friends. Um, and what's what's your uh, qualifications? <laughs> what's, I mean, like, what's your degree? Yeah, I sometimes wonder yeah. my qualifications. No, I'm licensed as a psychologist in Tennessee. And so you have self-talk about your fraud? You're a fraud secretly, like everybody else. <laughs> you know, not as much. <laughs> well, but that's yeah, what I heard I know, when you said I, know. I question my qualifications all the time. <laughs> I think that's this universal thing that everybody uh, has this secret fear that they're going to be discovered. Yeah, that's one of the good things about uh, getting older, though. Uh, age doesn't doesn't necessarily mean progression of wisdom, but sometimes you know we are able to grow and become more comfortable. In fact, I was reading. Sandberg's book on biography on on Lincoln, mm-hmm. and after his second election, he stepped out onto the North Portico or whatever uh, ports that was, and uh, had to have someone hold a candle so he could read his little speech to the crowd that was out there. and And he commented to the man at at this age, I care less and less what people think because mm-hmm. it didn't look, you know, very presidential. Oh, the the journey to get more and more comfortable in one's own skin. Is never ending and 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 crescendoing. Hopefully, ideally, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, you were on the show, episode eighty nine. What's the episode now? One twenty nine. One twenty nine. Okay. But w- I was looking back to on your note. I mean, to to note which which episode you were, and there were three Davids in a row, and they were, it's pretty significant because there's you, progressive thinker, ex Christian, professional, and pretty smooth transition out of your faith i mean it was right. it was it difficult was. but well yeah but you you've really come out on the other side like right. very comfortable with your where non, i'm at now yeah right. where you're at now david dark that was after that and he's to this day a christian um but a very progressive christian and then the third one is david <laughs> silverman <laughs> he's the president of american atheist right. and uh what we call firebrand yeah so anyway it's just an interesting trilogy of davids there yeah. i'm fascinated with the psychological uh, I'm fascinated with why people do what they do, why humans do what they do. My wife and I both are just infatuated with the brain and, and, and things like that. So I felt like it might be this added value to the show yeah, to every and, now and then have a, have a psychologist come yeah, on and yeah, talk another, about it. Yeah, another element I think you're trying to add to it. Yeah, and it's not every week. It's not every episode. Right. And we're not analyzing the guest, but we are talking about things that came up within the context of the guest's conversation. Right. And when we talked about that, that's what I said about Hank, that there were just some things that were just so easy to identify and pick up on yeah. as, because it relates to so many of your guests. Yeah, it is. There's some there's some common threads that, of course, yeah. come up. So what did, what did you hear? Well, I wanted to talk about the issue of denial okay, and what that means and how we understand it, how it relates to cognitive dissonance, because you often talk about that. Yeah. And Hank was just delightful. In fact, one of the things he said – I don't know anyone who listens 
because you were asking, are you out yet or not? And he, he said he's not really worried about using his name because I don't know anyone who listens. To, to my show. To your show. And yeah. then he quickly goes, no offense to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, nobody listens to your show, Cass. You know, it's what he felt like he might have been heard as. Right, but right. I was like, no, I get it. You don't not, have – None of his friends. None of the people that he's worried yeah. about coming out to. Yeah. So so when, uh, you, say, when you say denial, yeah. I'll just tell you what comes to my mind is, is burying one's head in the sand. Um, is that what you kind of think as far as like, don't bother me with the facts or la, 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 plug your ears, see well, no evil, hear no evil? Well, that can be a more deliberate process. Okay. Denial that we think of in terms of what we call a defense mechanism. Mm-hmm. Is subconscious? Is subconscious. Oh, okay. That there's a, a need to protect oneself mm-hmm. from things that might be disturbing, distressing, like the uh, denial of death. Well, I was just about to say, okay. you know, Ernest Becker's book is all about because – Death is so daunting and just horrifying right. that the fact that we are aware that we exist this is the three things he argues. We humans are aware we exist that we're going to someday die, and that we're aware that we could die at any moment at any time with, for reasons beyond our control. Those three things, if we really had them on the forefront of our minds, we would never get out of bed. It would be hard to cope. Yeah, it's it's paralyzing unless you get to a more mature place of acceptance. Of yeah, that. yeah, yeah, but that takes some work, right, on your own part, some in, yeah. introspection and stuff. But so those three things keep, paralyze you, and in order for you to get on with your life, get up, go to work, and and be happy, and that, I, I literally believe this to be true, that there are some maybe even evolutionarily evolved survival mechanisms that are in place yeah. to keep you from being paralyzed well, by those well, things. Well, that's a good point, too, and that, and that gets to the place of uh, – it's not my place as a therapist when, when I'm in that role mm-hmm. of trying to disrupt uh, people's defense mechanisms necessarily to pull it out from under them because they may not be at that place yet. Mm-hmm. may need that as a way of coping in this world. We all have some defenses. Some are more mature than others. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but they come into your office and you can tell that this is something that is protecting them. This is something that is helping them stay happy, or at least to whatever degree. And if I come in and just presumptuously yank it out, that's right. not really not only professional on your part, but it's not really sensitive to their human it's not sensitive to them, and I'd say it's probably not helpful either. No, you're, you're getting There's got to be a process. It's going to get worse. And I know. You know, when you're sometimes with people's um, mental health journeys, they kind of, it does need to get worse before it gets better, but it doesn't have to be at your prov- yeah. provocation. Well, another <laughs> example this is probably the most common use of the idea of psychological denial is with addiction. Where okay. Everyone else in their life can see that they have a problem. Yeah. But in sincerity, they can say, I don't have a problem. Mm-hmm. I can quit anytime I want to. Mm hmm. And that's a, this is the denial you're talking and about. And that's the unconscious part because they believe that. They need to believe that because having a problem is too scary for them. Seeing how their life is getting out of control is too scary. Yeah. One of the phrases that I learned in, in my own personal therapy was uh, I'm having a problem with having a problem. And that that ends up showing up a lot. I mean, like part of like why we overreact to maybe we're oversensitive when somebody says something critical, right. and we freak out. We take a, we take it so personal. Right. It's because internally we already know we yes. have a problem, yeah. and now you've brought it to the fore, and I have a problem with with having a problem. And so denial protects us from that. Yes, and it, if I consciously knew that's what I was doing, it wouldn't be denial, right? No. But I don't recognize why I have such strong emotion when you bring up that subject and I have to come on so hard. Mm -hmm. It's because of my own insecurity that I can't even acknowledge. Yeah. So let's translate that to deconversion process, which is what our show is about. So obviously people that hold their beliefs dear gives their life meaning. a lot of their identity could be wrapped up in their faith. And, you know, you see politicians all the time say, you're asking me to leave my faith at the door. It's a part of my life, you know. Mm-hmm. And so it's just interwoven into their construct. I mean, their worldview and their self-view. Right. How they see the world, how they see themselves is all framed within the religious narrative that they've chosen, in most cases on this show, Christianity. So when somebody comes along, and or maybe not even somebody comes along, they just – Actually, internally, they kind of say, you know what, there's a chance there was no Adam and Eve, and something begins to rattle or whatever. Right. And they are going, uh, you know, I'm asking, are they going to kick into some form of deny- subconsciously? 
Well, that, that's the other point, too. That there's the <clears throat> unconscious denial, certainly, where they're having a reaction that they're not really conscious of why they're having that reaction. Mm-hmm. The other thing that you addressed in his show, and I'm, I'm actually going to pinpoint a couple of things that he said, has to do with cognitive dissonance, and that's where it becomes a more conscious. I begin to recognize this is making me uncomfortable, mm-hmm. and I understand why it's making me uncomfortable, and I need to resolve this somehow. So that takes some self-awareness on the part yes. of the participant there because they're they're listening to their body or they're noticing what they notice. And not just reacting in, in that naturally defensive, i got to protect myself. I say naturally, again, from an unconscious standpoint. Mm-hmm. So, for example... <clears throat> Early in the interview, he said, either I was in denial. (laughs) He comes right out and says it. Yeah. Or I just didn't come to the realization yet that the process, meaning the deconversion, had already been started. Yeah. I thought that was revealing. Yes, it was. And I think a lot of people listening would relate to that in that. So I was a Christian. I I was raised kind of, you know, pseudo-Christian, but I took it on personally at age 15. Like, big time. Right. I got more religious than my parents. I took it to another level. I was serious as fuck for the next right. uh, 20 years. It meant everything to you. It, was, it meant everything. So for 25 years, uh, I was just a very zealous Christian. Along the way, I had tons of doubt. Tons. Okay. Oh, yeah. I mean, I went to college. <laughs> and so I had a philosophy class that totally rocked my world. And so I felt... I felt the tectonic shifts like rumbling, and I, you know, w- always found my way back to faith. Okay. And well, there was a way you resolved the dissidence. Then you found a way to reconcile it. Yeah. So, so but that, I but I was aware that this yeah. doesn't make sense, and both of these things can't be true. Those kind of things. Yeah. But that's the conscious process. Okay. And there, there so were, in your, there in, were three triggers that I identified. That was part of the process of moving him from denial and then to cognitive dissonance, which is still occurring. With him. Oh, yeah, with he's him. right in the middle of it, yeah. with Hank. Um, so the first thing was the suicide of his men. Well, I won't say the first thing, but the thing I picked up on was the suicide of his mentor. Mm-hmm. That this guy that had really been a mentor to him. Had it all suicide. together. He's like, how could this be possible? Yeah. Then there was also the uh, the church that he was working with that found a dishonest way to squeeze him out. Mm-hmm. And I would say that was their denial, which often occurs that I'm doing this good thing and I, I'm dishonest with myself about how I'm going about doing this in a manipulative, dishonest way well, to this, hurt this person. The story they told themselves is this is the gentlest way to let him down. Right, right. And then the uh, <clears throat> brother-in-law of his soon-to-be ex-wife. Mm-hmm who uh, flipped the switch one day, it seemed like to him, we don't know what the brother-in-law's process was like, and walked away from it. Mm -hmm. I'm not a Christian anymore. So those kinds of things really rattled him, shook him uh, in the process, so that he began to be more conscious about it. And is still in the process. What did he say? I came into the interview a little worried about how I would come out of the conversation. (laughs) Yeah. Well, (laughs) So things are still afloat for him. Yeah. And you just love that about him. He's just so open and uh, the conversation with you, the back and forth with you. He's he's really in that process. Yeah, he's right in the middle of it. And and I know you you and I both know that these are things that we held dear and then of course if you're still in it, hold dear in present tense. Right. And I'm not going to be flippant or casual about releasing them. Uh it's going to take probably several like little tremors of these these events, those three events you just listed, one by one, they're they're yes. chipping away at the foundation of that which we hold dear and believe to be true. And uh, I'm just saying that they're not easy to give up, and and we will look a lot of dissonance in the face before we relinquish. Right. That was where you made reference to if you had an X Y axis yeah. that you could plot out. Yeah. To understand that process. Yeah, and I remember listening back to when I was editing the show. I was I hate I hate it when I do this. I do this all the time. I'm doing it right now. And that is I start a thought and then I never finish it on the show, you know. And so this is great. I'm th- I'm great grateful to go back and maybe finish yeah. what I, where I think I was heading with that. And um yeah, I was thinking that one of the axes. Oh, so we're measuring like every believer or, or non, I guess, but 
No, this yeah, is believer. Gonna, this is going to be yeah. a, a chart of where where you fall on this on this grid. Uh, and the x-axis would be the degree in which you need it to you be true. It. Right. So I remember the first time that I was, I, w- I was still I was really on my way out. I was way on the back end, still in, such that I was at a Barnes and Noble and I saw on the bookshelf a whole rack. Well, you know, because it just came out, full of uh, Christopher Hitchens' "God Is Not Great: How Religion Poisons Everything," and I remember a physiological response right. to that book and to just the title. That's actually a great example mm-hmm. because cognitive dissonance. The reason that it makes a difference and is so important in mm-hmm. resolving matters is it creates a state of anxiety or discomfort or dis-ease that has to be resolved. Mm-hmm. Now, if it's just a passing thought because it's not really important to you, there's not, not anything there to resolve. It doesn't create any dissidence. Yeah. But in that case, you had a physical reaction. It created a state that you needed to resolve. Yeah, so the X and Y would be the X is how much I need it to be true, and the Y would be the grief or the anxiety that I feel created by the cognitive dissonance. So since I need God to be great, the God in my imagination is great. He's my best friend. Don't fuck with him, Christopher Hitchens. Don't you dare insult the God who hung on a cross to, to die for your sins. How insulting and how presumptuous and arrogant of you to shake your fist to the heavens of this God who, who loves you. You're fucking with my God. So my defenses and my anxiety and probably, right. you know, my armpits, I mean, some right. I'm physiologically getting a, a, yeah. a, a real worked up over this. And it's because I needed it to be true. You need it to be true. And when you think about the X, Y, and how best to plot this out, one way of thinking about the, the Y axis, if you do it that way, mm-hmm. is the degree of doubt mm-hmm. that it creates. And the higher you are and your need for it to be true and then suddenly something is creating the doubt the more distressing yeah it's going to be well it's like you got if you got a it's instead of a, a car just hitting a, a wall you got two cars hitting each other right. so it's going to the velocity in the explosion is going to be bigger because the, the amount of doubt or the amount of yeah the amount of doubt i've i've let in <laughs> you know or that i'm entertaining is like you said if if i don't really doubt Right. Like if I have no confidence in Christopher Hitchens and I can totally write him off. Right. He's an idiot. He has no idea what he's talking about. Then my anxiety uh, is going to be minimal. Right. Because I can walk away and not feel anything. And that's why an individual who is in a place of denial, they don't have anxiety. The denial is working very effectively to keep that anxiety down. Yeah. Which and is so they don't dig deeper. They don't need to resolve it. Mm-hmm. No. It goes back to that denial of death. Ernest Specker, the, the reason that the world, like even I, right now in America, you go out on a street on a Monday morning and it's busy bustle, everybody going about their lives. Well, all our denial mechanisms are working. Because, otherwise, we would never get right, out of bed. Right. And so Christianity or religion or any kind of narrative, and really what Becker called culture, is we frame ourselves in in a in a narrative that says I matter, and that my life matters, oh, right. and that I have purpose, and there's a trajectory. I, you know, God has a plan for your life, right? And so, and, and afterlife too. Oh yeah, that this is going somewhere. This is not a chaotic, absurd existence with with no order. This is completely structured order with a with a happy ending. Right. I feel better. <laughs> I feel better. And now that I have, it's almost like a what a pair of glasses that you put on, or like you know a helmet that you put over over your. Like if you're in an atmosphere like Moon, where the oxygen level is such that you can survive without this oxygen mask oh, right so the narrative is the is the oxygen mask that allows you to walk around the moon and not die right uh so yeah i like that yeah okay, okay. Yeah. so I'm, I'm not a social psychologist i haven't tried to analyze and uh, uh in terms of the broader society i i work with individuals where they're at and, yeah but religion you can see how re- religion absolutely can be a way of sparing people Mm-hmm. anxiety yeah well all right so that brings us to what we wrestle with here on the show all the time and that is how uh evangelistic are we supposed to be with our atheism and everybody comes in lands on it differently right <laughs> uh i've said many times i don't give a rat's ass what you believe unless you begin to legislate it and it gets all up in my business but even then 
how do we go, how would I go about trying to deconstruct say senator what's his name or whoever that 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 holds this like say for example uh science denial and and climate change denial uh your your denial yeah i think you're raising a question i don't have a good answer for i know for me when i'm in a better place then i hope i can respond to individuals by still acknowledging them without putting them down yeah that's where they're at and, well, I, and I don't need to be, become so defensive. I get caught up in trying to evangelize mm-hmm. and, and come across in such a strong way that it's off-putting. But that's me. Not everyone agrees with that. Well, no, but I, I think it's a healthy and a mature position that, that you're taking because, I mean, you may be familiar with this phrase, people aren't going to abandon a belief that they obtained by faith by being confronted with logic. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. If I came at you with logic about your stupid belief, you didn't form it by way of logic, so it's not going to deform or deconstruct by way of logic because I'm speaking a language that's not a threat to your faith because, as you and I both know, faith says, uh, this is just what I believe and I don't understand it, doesn't make sense, and it's built in that God did it in a way that would be uh, – insulting to human wisdom man's wisdom is not god's wisdom god knows what he's doing we don't and so for me to come and and try to present the wisdom of man and the knowledge of man and the science of man they've already got a built-in protective how how can you argue against that yeah it's it's (laughs) kind of uh, robust and and steely locked in And, and so if it's just a matter of logic you ought to be able to have a back and forth discussion reasonable discussion mm-hmm. but you see people get very emotional with it with religion w- with religion and defending it yeah because and, it's and not so if they're having to be that emotional about it it's it's stirring mm-hmm. something inside of them they're not in touch with yeah you don't see two welders getting all upset about one of them saying this metal was formed right. you know i mean something that's just logical right facts we just know information we know how this metal was formed there's no argument here but in all all these ambiguous uh terms especially ontological like how did we get here what is the meaning of life all these things that there is no concrete answers for people have formed their own right and they guard them by way of denial and, and, again, religion has been a way in which they don't have to deal with those questions. They've been given answers. It yeah. makes sense to them. They don't have to think more deeply than that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so there is this seeding or, like, referring. Like, if I came, came to you and I said, why are you doing it this way? You would just say, well, talk to my boss. I'm just doing it the way, <laughs> you know, I'm just doing it the right, way he said. Right. I'm, I'm, you're not in that fight. And, and I think when sometimes when we confront Christians, they just say, hey, I'm not even going to debate with you about that because God said it, I believe it, and that's good enough for me. Now, now I, I'm also feeling the need for us to be careful not to broad brush, and I know this is true of you, sure. because you think of somebody like David Dark. Mm-hmm. He's very conscious and aware <laughs> and very well developed in, in his ideas and beliefs. So mm-hmm. you know, he's not in a state of denial at all. No, and the, this is what's uh, fascinating, and I, I don't know, we can get uh, – I I'll often I just feel like I'm getting to be an elitist when it comes to like well you don't have the intellectual capacity to juggle nuance and so you're a black and white thinker and I just patronize that person right down to <laughs> yeah and and you have individuals that are very intelligent mm-hmm. but but they're blocked in some ways emotionally yeah when Christians pull out that one of the chief scientists PhD from Harvard or whatever he's still right. a Christian they pull that out as like see. <laughs> right, and and there is a degree in which I have to throw up my hands and say, yeah, that doesn't make any sense to my 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 grid, right? Because I, in my grid, intelligence e- equals a lesser potential to be duped or self deluded, right? And so when I see somebody that I think is self deluded, and yet I know they have a high IQ and a high education, then I'm like, wow, I don't know how how that compartmentalization goes on, right? You know, so I guess I end for me. Coming back to the place that this is just fundamentally human, yeah. having defense mechanisms. We talk about primitive defense mechanisms mm-hmm. and then more mature ones. <laughs> uh, denial is just at the, the, the base of you know the primitive Primal. ones. Yes. And therefore, the person ex- exercising it, I mean, we, there is no malice. Right. And as a friend of That's that true. type of person, or maybe you have a family member that is in, that, you know, you have this difference in, in religious beliefs, and this person has this pr- 
primal denial system that's that's kind of keeping it intact and they're not they're not a dick they're not an asshole then you know you and i are of the camp that says leave them alone you can engage in conversation but certainly to do so respectfully absolutely well cool man i really appreciate your insights and just the the world of psychology and what it what it already knows about us because if we if we're equipped with uh oh i understand why my mom is acting this way that gives us the tools to be kind right because we can cut them some slack and assume no malice like i just said so these are these are ways that i think we can be better people okay well I, i appreciate being with you thanks dave I could